Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and a good morning to all joining us from the Central, Mountain, and Pacific time zones. In case this is your first time with us, my name is Keisha Shropshire and I'm the P2P Workshop Coordinator. First, we will do a very quick review of the housekeeping before we get started. Next slide, Catherine. Next slide. Catherine, I think I have the wrong slides on the screen. Okay. This is what I got off of the box this morning. Okay, do you want to, I think I have presenter. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen then. Okay. If you have the right slides available. So do you see it on the screen now? Yep. Okay, thank you. Hold on one second, let me regroup myself. Okay. Okay, so uh, welcome again, and I'm happy to greet you on our final day of our three-day workshop. We're so excited you're here. We're looking forward to another informative and productive event. Similar to the other uh, workshop days, we've incorporated a few breaks throughout the workshop to give you 10 minutes to stand up, stretch, refuel, et cetera, as needed. During each break, you will see a countdown clock to inform you of the time to return and resume the event. Please note that today's workshop is being recorded and the recording will be available in about one month on the ODP webpage at prevention.nih.gov forward slash P2P nutrition cancer health. The chats will be saved as part of the public record and used for note taking purposes. It'll tell you everything you need to know about our workshop and it is it is where you can find the workshop agenda, um, the independent panel bios, speaker bios and abstracts, draft systematic evidence review and the panel's draft report, which will be available in fall of 2022. We encourage you to share your comments and questions in the chat pod at any time during the presentations. Um, questions and comments will be taken via the WebEx chat pod. You may access the chat feature in the bottom right corner of the WebEx window, which is located next to pr the participants pod in the three dots. Once the chat is selected, use the drop down menu within the chat to select everyone. It is important that you make your chat, make sure your chat is going to everyone so that all speakers, panelists, and attendees can view and participate in the discussion. You may need to scroll down to find this option. Please do not send private chats to the host. When asking a question, please state the presenter's name to identify which speaker your question is being directed. Questions and comments may also be sent via email, or you may join the conversation on Twitter by tweeting your question using hashtag NIHP2P. All questions will be compiled, triaged, and then shared with the workshop chair to be answered by the designated speaker during the discussion and Q&A session. Should you experience any technical difficulties and need support, please use the WebEx chat pod to send a message to all panelists or email us at nihp2p at mail.nih.gov. Our hosts, our WebEx hosts, will assist you with troubleshooting and resolving the issue. To access the closed captions for this workshop, click on the multimedia viewer feature at the bottom right corner of the WebEx window. To make content appear larger or smaller on your screen, use the plus and minus signs about the, uh, above the slides in your WebEx window. We invite you to review and, pro and provide feedback on the draft systematic evidence review prepared by the Minnesota Evidence-Based Practice Center, which is available on the ODP website until August the 23rd. 
The panel's draft, will, um, which will summarize the workshop and provide recommendations for future research priorities, will be available in fall of 2022 on the ODP website. Please remember to fill out the post-workshop evaluation survey at the end of each workshop day. The survey is different for each day. A survey link will be posted in the chat pod and each attendee will also receive an email from the WebEx with the survey link. It should take you only five to 20, 10 minutes. We would really appreciate your feedback about today's event as it will help us improve our P2P program. Well, those are all the points that I'd like to cover for now. I will now turn it over to Dr. Hyatt, our workshop and panel chair, to give us the workshop overview and to introduce today's objectives and key question four. Following the workshop overview, we will hear from two amazing individuals who will share their stories and experience as patients with oncology nutrition care. Afterwards, Dr. Hyatt will moderate a brief discussion and Q&A session. Welcome, Dr. Hyatt. Thank you, uh, Keisha. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Bob Hyatt. I'm a professor at uh, University of California, San Francisco, professor of epidemiology and biostatistics, and also one of the leaders of our cancer center here. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate uh, the session today, as it was the last two days. And uh, my uh, role will be to keep us uh, on track, and uh, I will help with uh, answering um, your questions and uh, directing them to the speakers. So, uh, in the first two days, um, which were packed with uh, information and uh, interesting uh, presentations, um, we heard from uh, speakers on research questions one and two, which dealt with the effect of nutritional interventions for individuals with uh, malnutrition. Uh, and uh, on the uh, second day, we uh, talked about the effects of nutritional interventions in covering uh, symptoms or treating symptoms, uh, and also um, answered questions about uh, nutritional interventions in uh, special populations defined by uh, various and sundry uh, demographic characteristics or locations or um, other um, individual characteristics, age, for example, older individuals. Uh, <clears throat> and we also um, talked about the uh, impact of uh, food insecurity uh, and uh, its effects on, on treatment. Today, we're going to talk uh, 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 about issues related to obesity. That's the fourth uh, question that we have, the fourth research question. Um, and I must say that these questions as they're being answered have a lot uh, to inform other the other questions. So we're getting a, a, a full picture of the field uh, at this point. Uh, it's a very heterogeneous uh, field, very challenging. Uh, and we look forward to the speakers today to help us uh, clarify uh, issues related to obesity. Uh, thank you very much. We'll go ahead with the next um, section of our program. Thank you, Dr. Hyatt, for that nice overview. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Tim McDonald and JJ Singleton to join us on our session titled Oncology Nutrition Care, What is Really Going On? We are truly privileged to have Tim and JJ here with us today. Tim, you may begin. My name is Tom McDonald, and I am a stage for Oncology Cancer Nutrition. Stand by, technical difficulty. Um, JJ, would you like to go ahead and we'll do uh, Tim's presentation uh, after yours, if that's uh, possible? I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute you so uh, we can get you started and I will uh, get this audio circumstance sorted out for a second. 
time day day. All right, JJ, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, can you hear us now or can we hear you, JJ? I am showing JJ is unmuted. Uh, we are not hearing you yet. Uh, JJ, make sure your phone's not muted. Uh, I am still not hearing JJ. Give me one moment. I'll see if I can get this video sorted out. My name is Tim McDonald. I am a stage four colon cancer patient with metastasis to my liver. I was diagnosed in November of 2020, right around Thanksgiving, right after Thanksgiving. Um, I went in. Sound quality is uh, very crackly. Right, plank. Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I, I am. I am. Where they determined it was um, possibly kidney stone, but they weren't sure, so they ordered a CT scan, went in that Monday. Uh, uh, some sort of thing happened when we ended the practice session. I have to reconnect. Shall we take a five minute break and then we can get this together? I think that's great. Okay. Thank you. If you've recently joined the workshop, uh, please stand by because we are resolving some technical issues. Thank you. Where they determined it. I think we have solved it. Uh, I'm going to give it a quick test and then uh, I think we can. My name is Tim McDonald. I am a stage four colon cancer patient with metastasis to my liver. I was diagnosed in November of 2020, right around Thanksgiving, right after Thanksgiving. Um, I went in because I had some severe right plank uh, pain and went into my urgent care. They determined it was um, possibly kidney stone, but they weren't sure. So they ordered a CT scan, went in that Monday. Uh, and that Monday afternoon is when I got diagnosed uh, with having stage four cancer. 
Um, I had experienced some weight loss for the previous two to three months um, that was pretty significant, but it was all in my mind due to me just changing my diet to a much healthier diet with grains and fresh fruits and vegetables um, instead of fried foods and white breads and all that stuff. And um, so it wasn't a symptom for me, or at least I didn't think it was of my cancer, but after I was diagnosed with this cancer um, and I ended up getting on a very aggressive chemo treatment, um, about six months after I was diagnosed, I got into a cancer center here in Tampa where um, they put me on full Fox Fury. That ended up, um, making me lose more weight. So before I was diagnosed, I went from weighing around 215 to 220 down to about 190, 195. And then after I started getting on the full Fox Fury, six weeks after I was diagnosed, I continued to lose weight till I got down to about 180, um, 185. And at that point, when I first went into the cancer center at Moffitt, I had, they had brought up the fact that there was an opportunity for me to speak with a um, nutritionalist on staff that could give me some ideas. And <clears throat> as we were going through this treatment, everything was so new to me. Everything was still so fresh in my mind. I was hearing all these different things. I had plenty of friends telling me, you know, all the diets you should take, what you shouldn't eat, what you should eat. Um, and it just got a little bit overwhelming. So the one thing that stuck out with me was during that initial appointment at Moffitt that I could talk to a nutritionalist. And that led me to actually follow up because even though I had gotten my orders for my lab work to be done, I got the orders for my infusion to be done. I didn't see an order for my appointment with the nutritionalist. So I actually had to follow up and make sure that that happened. Um, the great thing that actually happened, because my wife and I are both pescatarians, is that we happened to get a nutritionalist. This is just out of chance that was a vegan, and she was really good at explaining to me some of the myths of what, you know, what I was hearing from a lot of my friends and everything about not eating sugar because sugar feeds cancer and telling me how that was a myth. Everything in moderation is fine. But most importantly, she was really emphasizing the fact of how you know, I really needed to keep myself hydrated and I also needed to give myself a lot of protein. And especially as a pescatarian, that could become very difficult. Um, and so really what I started doing was um, getting ideas from her on different types of foods that were high in protein, adding protein powder into some, some things that I was eating. Um, and really with my wife really started looking at, you know, a daily log of what we could do as far as my protein intake went. Um, we were using a lot of, uh, I was having a lot of smoothies with, uh, with extra protein powder in there. Um, I was eating a lot of the, the foods that, you know, salads and stuff that we could put in extra things that were high in protein. Um, you know, and just looking at all those options for me to really start putting weight on. But what I found was it was very difficult. And one of the reasons why my wife was so instrumental in helping me with this was the fact of I was just so depleted on energy, not feeling well, that really the opportunity for me getting food came from my wife really paying attention to the protein amounts that I was getting each day and really setting that to try and target at least 100 grams of protein each day. Um, we started doing that and gradually over time, even though I had adjustments because on full Fox Fury, it's like, you know, you have the sensitivity to the cold right after your chemo treatment. And so not being able to eat smoothies, which was a huge source of my protein, um, you know, things like that always changed getting hydrated because you had to drink something that was room temperature or warm instead of cold. And I don't mind drinking a ton of cold water, but I really don't like drinking lukewarm water. And so it was all these things about how we could hydrate, how we could get um, more protein in me during those times where I really wasn't able, either able to have the liquids or not really feeling like wanting to eat anything that would give me the protein or really anything at all. Um, 
over time, we kind of, you know, learned about my body and how I reacted. And once I got off of the full Fox Fury and was just on full Fury, I could then not have to worry about the cold sensitivity, was able to drink that. Um, but I think because of, uh, of the impact and the severity of kind of the side effects that the full Fox Fury gave me during that six months that I was on it, it really got me to a point where I honestly feel like if I hadn't pushed and advocated for myself to get that appointment with the nutritionist, even though it was offered to me to, during my initial appointment, um, I don't know if I would actually be here today. It was I was feeling that weak. I probably wouldn't have known the importance of the protein. Um, and, and just those two factors, I think, of being able to have somebody that was kind of an expert in this area and really be able to speak to what I was going through um, with the chemo that I was on, with the side effects that I was experiencing, and giving me some alternatives of what I could do as far as both liquids and the proteins go to get them in my body when I didn't feel hungry. I don't know if I would have been here um, and be able to sit here and talk to you today because I really feel like the diet was that important to me really being strong enough to, you know, have my body healthy enough in, in all other ways to be able to respond positively to the chemo treatment. So that was a huge element for me was really looking at that. Um, I think that, you know, over the course of the 18 months now that I've been on chemo, I've really seen and gotten a little bit better at understanding like certain types of foods I can eat and, and drink at certain times um, and certain times I can't, all depending on how the chemo is making me feel at the time. Um, you know, but I was just reminded a couple months ago um, after my colon resection and I went through this, um, you know, two months pause of being off of chemo, went right back on to the, the full fury, which I had been on for, you know, eight months previously, and then get back on it again, thinking it was going to react the same way my body was going to react the same way it did before and learn that it didn't. And, you know, being not being able to keep anything down because I had to throw up um, after like just eating one or two bites of anything, um, having to have diarrhea every time I had something to drink or something to eat. It was just this constant battle of me not being able to put a lot into my body, but yet anything that I did would come out. And so really talking with, again, calling up to the hospital, I didn't talk to the nutritionist, but I talked to their team and just got some ideas of what could be helpful in that. And that really helped me, I think, understand, you know, how to drink the electrolytes in the fluids to get those in, um, how I could combat it a little bit with some different anti-diarrheal um, uh, medicines and also some anti-nausea medications that I was on. Um, but my recovery from that colon resection I actually had pre-surgery and also post-surgery the opportunity to talk with somebody who um, not before was not a nutritionist, but an overall RN with a little element on the nutrition element of preparing for the surgery before, during, and after. But then right after I had the colon resection, having a nutritionalist came in and started talking to me about the the um, the low fiber and um, and I'm forgetting the other term for what it was, but really helping me understand what I could put into my body so that you know this this new surgery would be able to process that and get it through without causing me more issues and that really helped and as i look now as far as being eligible to get a living liver donor um hopefully coming up later this year as soon as i find the the right donor for me um understanding how i'm going to prepare for that surgery both pre during and post with what I can bring in is going to be so important. So one of the things that I will ask for if I don't have it is, can I talk to a nutritionalist to make sure that I can understand what kind of foods I can have, what's going to be the healthiest for me and the easiest to be able to digest and go through my body um, during a, a transplant procedure like this. Um, so those are all things that I'm, you know, I'm really looking at. Um, and, you know, because each surgery that I, I've, you know, started to go through, each round of chemo that I go through, it's just your body reacts kind of differently every time to it. And I think kind of listening to your body, taking what you've learned from the past and, and making sure that you're continually asking questions about, you know, what you're going to be going through soon, 
is so helpful in starting to understand what you can put into your body that's going to be a little bit more digestible and run through you a little bit smoother. Um, what kind of liquids you can have, how much of both of those things you can have, I think is going to have a, a huge, huge impact in not only my recovery, but also in just how quick I recover from this, um, this, these types of procedures. So I think that's why it's really so important. Um, and I, I really think that, you know, one thing that I've learned is just how fortunate I was to be at a cancer center that actually had a nutritionist on staff and to make that available to their patients. And if there's one thing that I can suggest is, you know, if you're going to a cancer center, you have somebody that doesn't have this available, you know, advocate for yourself, find out who you can talk to, be able to talk to somebody, even if it's over just Zoom or something to be able to get the information, because I think it helps so much in, in you know, what you're going to do and how you can pre prepare yourself to be the healthiest you can be to be able to go through this kind of journey, um, whether you want to call it a battle or, or a journey, whatever you want of dealing with with cancer and the chemotherapy and how you can really help have nutrition play a huge role in how that helps you. So really being your own advocate to make this happen, even if it's not available at your cancer center would be one thing that I would just hugely, hugely suggest. So thank you so much for allowing me to share my story with you. And I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thanks everyone. That was uh, Tim's pre-recorded session. Tim is um, was unable to join us live today. Um, James, I think we are ready to welcome JJ. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Thank hey, you. Uh, my name is. Yeah, it's great to be here. Sorry that I've had some technical difficulties where I've had to call in on the phone and can't do a live video, but my name is JJ Singleton. I was diagnosed at the age of 27 with colon cancer. And before that, I was a healthy college football player. After that, I kind of got out of shape, but the year 2015, I was getting back into shape, healthy, working out, and then cancer popped up. So I really, I mean, I had a good background in the nutrition and eating right for a football player, but not a cancer patient. But as I was diagnosed, I lost 60 pounds from uh, August 1st to uh, when I got out of surgery in October. And at first I thought that was going to be the biggest weight loss. And that was just because I couldn't eat nothing. The tumor was uh, blocking my whole, almost my whole colon. So I was getting sick every time I tried to eat hard to use the bathroom, so I pretty much just quit eating at that point. But they uh, they took out 80% of my colon to remove the tumor, and then I started chemo. And chemo was rough on me because there was so uh, big ups and downs as my six months or 12 treatments of chemo went. I would have mouth sores that would get so bad I couldn't hardly swallow any food. It would just make my mouth bleed, and I... Uh, didn't, nothing tastes right, nothing tastes good. I would throw up constantly. And then there would be chemo treatments where I could eat and keep things down and gain some weight. Don't know if that was from the eating or all the steroids that they were giving me. But I was able to stay right around 200 pounds then. But the thing I noticed, because I live in a small town, kind of close to Asheville, North Carolina, but my cancer center did not have a uh, full-time dietitian or nutrition on staff. I met with one in the hospital, but what I found out is they just kind of gave basic meal plans for you based on your body, your age, and what you were going through. And I quickly realized that that wasn't good for me because how chemo affected me with my mouth sores and my nausea that what they suggested I eat, I, I couldn't. I couldn't stomach it. I couldn't eat it at all. And then that's when I was started thinking that the dietitians need to uh, have a more individualized plan for us in cancer because everybody's cancer is so different. Everybody reacts different to the treatments. But I finished chemo and I thought I was better. And then my cancer came back. And 
we had a rougher chemo, more chemo, harder, more uh, powerful chemos. And the dietitian I met then pretty much gave me the same advice as before. So I was trying to learn myself about how to keep up weight, but I was steadily losing weight. And then my cancer kept growing. And in 20, uh, the end of 2016, the cancer grew around my stomach and completely closed off my stomach to where I had to live the next 14 months on TPN nutrition. And then this made it easy to gain weight then because I was getting all my nutrients into my pork. Never had to worry about being hungry. Never had to worry about being sick or throwing anything up. So for 14 months, I stayed pretty much at a steady weight and was kind of healthy. But then I did miss eating. I missed the taste of food. So they corrected the surgery once my uh, clinical trial drug stabilized my cancer. And this is when I found out that not eating for 14 months completely changed how food tastes, how my body reacted to eating. And I was still getting treatments because my cancer is incurable. So I've been on active treatments for a little over six years now. And to go through that is pretty much a roller coaster ride. I can go a couple months where I can eat pretty good, and then I'll go a couple months where I, it's a struggle to eat about any food to get the nutrients that I need to gain weight or even stay at a healthy weight. And there's so many side effects that come up as a result of being on treatment for so long. Like the mouth sores and the mouth issues that I have are constant now. They don't go away in between treatments. I've had oral mucosis in my mouth for about two and a half years straight right now. So it, it's a struggle to eat anything that isn't soft or liquid at times. And still to this day, like my cancer center is uh, still like not, don't have a full-time dietitian. My oncologist wants to get there, but they just don't have the funding available. And this has led to me having the huge weight swings again. There's been two more times where I've lost 50 plus pounds in two months. And then as the treatments go, and I'm stable right now, but now I've developed celiac disease, which is going to make my nutrition even harder because I'm allergic to gluten. And the symptoms that I have is it makes my intestines inflamed and bleed more. And they're already struggling because I have so little of intestines and the, treat, or the treatment that I'm on isn't the easiest on them. So really what I've learned in this is I would love to see some way to get like full-time dietitians to the smaller areas and not just like the big cancer centers and big cities because everybody needs that resource to help because there's a lot of people that won't be able to sustain through treatments and through cancer. And then for each of the dietitians, nutritionists to realize that Cancer is not just a one path, even in colon cancer, because it's all different. Everybody reacts different. And we got to have more individualized support for what people can eat and what people won't eat. But that is my story, and it was an honor to be here. I thank every one of you for listening to me, and I will be able to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, JJ. We really appreciate that. Um, that was a very enlightening story. And I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Hyatt to facilitate just a brief di uh, discussion and, and Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> yes, JJ, that was uh, very, uh, very moving. And, and, and you're clearly a very strong individual to have gone through all this and still be willing to join us today and talk about it. So, um, uh, the, the kind of questions we are getting from the audience are um, multiple uh, aspects of your condition, but maybe one of the things would be, I mean, uh, you're, you're clearly supportive of the idea of having uh, nutritional ad advice. When do, you, when do you think is the right time to, to get nutritional uh, advice when you have uh, cancer or um, think that you have cancer? For me, it was uh, 
after you get over the shock and the after the surgery is when I was best accepted advice from anybody because kind of the shock wore off and I was not afraid of or I was able to process information then because when you first hear those words you're everything just zooms out or kind of is fuzzy so I think to be there to have somebody come in after the surgery or right before they start the treatments to give them an overview of what is possible and then go back to them after maybe a treatment or two to discuss how they're handling it okay that's great uh what was the what was the most difficult point um uh, for you in introducing these new eating habits for me it's just uh it was finding stuff that was able to i was able to handle with the nausea and my mouth sores because like my mouth like gets so raw and so sore that anything with texture would cause me to bleed and like it was hard to swallow but i needed the nutrients because i was already so weak from the weight loss and the surgeries and the ongoing treatments it was just to be able to find something to give me enough nutrients and something that i could stomach because eating and then throwing up pretty much instantly for the next few hours was never fun um i think you would agree that uh, face to face help from a nutritionist or dietitian uh is ideal but living in a rural area as you do would telemedicine and uh, doing it over the uh, computer have been uh, helpful for you and, and and what do you think about that approach to to uh, counseling well before 2020 i would have said i would have hated the telemedicine or anything over the computer or phone but now i think it's more such a way of life for everybody that it's a lot more normal and people are used to it where i would i fully support that now because I, I have a lot of my appointments and meetings and sessions with like therapists and people over the computer yeah good um so i'm looking i'm looking just uh jj at some of the other comments that are coming in here um yeah comments supporting uh, telemedicine trying to get it to more people where they can't go to the yeah. big cancer centers um was it difficult for you to get access to total parental nutrition given your rural uh, location um it was i had a few weeks where we were getting very nervous where they the delivery wasn't until like right when i was supposed to start it and then one time we had to get a special bag put in during a snowstorm to get me to the next day when the delivery came. But my doctors were great at that because they they tried every option. While I was in the hospital for a month trying to get, they were trying to do feeding tubes and different things where it just didn't work. So this was my last option to get nutrients. So they pulled out all the stops to get it, got me to, or signed up for a home health, and then they were great. Great. Um, okay. Um, I think we need to uh, go on to the next section. JJ, I want to thank you again. Are you getting excited about following the uh, National Football League games again? Yes, yeah, definitely. And college football. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Back yeah. to you, Tisha. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thanks, JJ. And thank you, Dr. Hyatt. Thanks, JJ, for sharing your inspirational and heartening story. And Dr. Hyatt for moderating that engaging session. We will uh, shift our focus to our last key question for the workshop. We will hear from six presenters on key question four in a subset of key questions one and two. Following the initial four presentations, we will take a brief break, return to hear from the remaining two presenters, and then hold a discussion and Q&A session moderated by Dr. Hyatt. Dr. Helen Parsons will be our first presenter on key question four. She will discuss nutrition as prevention for improved cancer health outcomes, key question four, systematic evidence review result. Welcome, Dr. Parsons.
Thanks, Keisha, for the introduction. And I'd just like to extend my thanks again to JJ and Tim for sharing their stories. It's so important in order to provide context for the research that we'll be discussing today. All right, so to switch gears briefly, uh, we're going to move on to key question four uh, from the systematic review. And so today I'm, I'm happy to present the findings from uh, on behalf of the Minnesota Evidence Based Practice Center. Key question four specifically asks uh, in adults with cancer who are overweight or over or obese, what is the effect of intentional weight loss either prior to or during cancer treatment in preventing negative outcomes associated with cancer treatment? Very briefly, uh, as many of you have seen this uh, slide before, but the, the context for the studies that were included in this component of the systematic review included adults who were diagnosed with cancer at or after age 18. We additionally, for this specific key question, focused only on population or on studies that enrolled populations that were either overweight or obese during the the study period. Uh, again, we en enrolled or we included studies that enrolled uh, individuals that were uh, studied with a wide range of interventions, everything from diet and nutrition therapy to the use of total parenteral through total parenteral therapy, uh, and focused again on an outcomes that were clinically focused, including treatment dose tolerance, hospital utilization, survival, nutrition status, and changes in weight and malnutrition across a wide variety of settings. The literature uh, came from a number of databases as shown on the screen here, and for the purpose of the review to identify the, the largest amount of high, high quality uh, studies, we focused on randomized control trials that randomized at least 50 participants uh, and examined information on the study design, participant characteristics, and outcomes for those studies that met our inclusion criteria. And as you'll see, because there was not a large amount of literature in this space, we did not conduct uh, risk of bias uh, for, the per for this specific systematic review. Now, when I say it's limited, um, we found two studies, uh, and so you can really see across the span of the entire systematic review, we had a much larger concentration overall in nutrition interventions that were focused on uh, interventions delivered after treatment began when people were undergoing therapy, and there was just a very small overall literature base that was focused on individuals who were either overweight or obese uh, and was focused on either weight loss or, or not uh, maintaining, um, maintaining weight. So I'd like to briefly go through the two, the two studies that were included as part of this key question. The first one compared calorie restriction with symbiotics on quality of life and edema res reduction in a population of individuals who are overweight and obese uh, and had breast cancer related lymphedema. And that was compared to having no intervention. The second study compared a diet that was designed to prevent weight gain versus a standard diet in women who were undergoing adjuvant chemotherapy therapy for breast cancer. Uh, and we were pretty generous with including this study, but um, the women were were um, not uh, did did not have um, the the clinical criterion had an average uh, BMI of only twenty four point seven. So the the reason um, that the study was conducted is that uh, the study authors noted that they were potentially at risk for weight weight gain. So I'd like to go into each of these studies in a bit more detail, just very briefly. So as you can see, um, for both of the studies, they were obviously both in breast cancer. Uh, they were in younger breast cancers and enrolled a moderate number of individuals, 94 and 135 respect respectively. Uh, they were all female. Um, and one thing I'd like to note, I hadn't noted this in my prior pre presentations, but uh, race was not reported. Uh, from the overall study populations, and that tended to be a, a theme that we noted across our studies as well. Uh, overall, these were over were earlier stage uh, breast cancers. Uh, if we focus first on the BAFA study for the um, 
on the, in the first line here. And for that one, they received a, a calorie restricted diet plus a colony forming unit symbiotic supplement in an outpatient setting versus a placebo. And they were focused on uh, weight and body composition changes as well as changes in quality of life. Uh, for the second study, they looked at the use of a Mediterranean diet again in the outpatient setting versus just receiving a general recommendation for the prevention of cancer. Again, focusing on weight and body composition in this study as well. Overall, we found that there are uh, there's a fairly limited uh, literature base on looking at uh, weight loss, focusing um, on either prior to or during cancer treatment. The two studies we did identify uh, were assessing the effect of uh, intentional weight loss uh, or preventing weight gain, uh, and they were looking at uh, body composition changes as well as quality of life. So uh, overall, we know that there is a, a strong uh, growing incidence of overweight and obesity in those that are newly diagnosed with cancer. And I will note that uh, in conducting our systematic review that we, we did identify a number of studies that were focused on weight loss in individuals with cancer, uh, but oftentimes these were uh, focused on individuals post-treatment. Uh, and therefore they weren't included in this particular systematic review. So as a result, there's an opportunity to understand which interventions or components of those interventions may work best at improving either weight reduction or prevention of weight gain during the peritreatment period. If you would like more information on the methods or the, the studies that were included as part of this review, you can uh, access the full evidence report, and this is now available, uh, as Keisha mentioned, for a four-week public comment period at the website uh, in, on the slide. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Parsons, for sharing that evidence synthesis. Our second presentation is Low Muscle and Low Muscle Radio Density and Cancer Outcomes. Current Evidence, Gaps, and Future Research, given by Dr. Betty Kahn. You may begin, Dr. Kahn. Okay, can I have the first slide, please? They're loading, so uh, we have to wait okay. a second. Well, Sorry. I'm gonna start with thanking the organizers for this very informative meeting and inviting me to speak. Um, I'm, today I'm gonna to talk on low muscle sarcopenia and low muscle radiodensity known as myostatosis and cancer outcomes. I'm gonna to try to give you a general overview across cancer types and cancer stages while Dr. Barakos in the next talk will focus more on advanced cancer. Can I have the next slide, please? I have no information to disclose. And I'm gonna start by talking about some common definitions and what the prevalence is across cancers based on those definitions. Then you give, give you a little overview of the population evidence for how these conditions affect cancer outcomes. And then try to talk a little bit about the research gaps and future research ideas. Next slide, please. So let's start with the most common way that we measure sarcopenia, which is you know, the quantity in the muscle, and then low radio density, which, which is myostatosis, or the fat infiltration into the muscle in cancer. So because we have these opportunistic CT scans, we've developed programs based on the density of the tissue that we're able to segment um, the different body composition components. And today I wanna focus on the skeletal muscle. This is a cross-sectional uh, uh, at the L3 um, slice, and we're able to kind of uh, section it out. And so in the red, you can see that that denotes the skeletal muscle. And what's important to take from this slide is that someone with the same BMI can have a very different muscle level. So here's a BMI of 30. On the left-hand side, you see someone who has quite a bit of muscle. On the right-hand side, you see someone who has very little muscle. Next slide, please. We can also do the same thing with radio density. We can take the amount of muscle, the total muscle that a person has, and look in Hounsfield's units as at the radio density. So on the left-hand side, what you can see here 
is someone has higher radio density, less myostatosis, and likely more function. On the right-hand side, they have less muscle in the normal range, which is denoted in red, and more muscle in the darker blue and yellow, which denotes fat infiltration into the muscle, and so they have lower radio density. So we take these measures, next slide please, and then we say, how do we define sarcopenia or low radio density? And again, this is the most common way that we've been using in cancer, and what it is based on is we look at an important outcome like survival. So if you look at the top little graph, what they're, what they're looking at is how do these exposures relate to survival? And they look at where the influx of, where, where the risk really increases. And then they overlay that on the population um, distribution and they can tell the point at which below risk really increases. So now we have a bivariate variable and cut points based on, and, and most commonly we use risk of survival, but you can use other outcomes as well. And this method is known as optimal stratification. Next slide, please. So once we have these definitions, we can look at the prevalence of uh, both sarcopenia and low radio density. And what you can see from this slide, and what's important to know, is that these are highly prevalent conditions. And they're prevalent in cancers where survival is good, like breast cancer. That even in non-metastatic, non-advanced cancers, we're seeing about a third of the people having either sarcopenia or low muscle radio density or both. Same thing is true for colorectal cancer where survival is good. And the more refractory cancers like lung, and pancreatic, and liver, the rates are higher, but still it's prevalent in non-metastatic cancer. So this is something that might likely be a cult and um, is, is, needs to be taken care of. Next slide, please. And here's an example in non-metastatic breast cancer. And what we've done is we, pl we plotted BMI against the percentage of women who have these conditions. And what you can see is that sarcopenia is more likely to occur in people who are um, on the lower end of the BMI spectrum, but quite prevalent in people in, you know, at least a BMI in the normal range of 20 to 25. Low muscle radio density happens to occur in people who are more on the higher end of the BMI spectrum. But importantly, almost 60% of non-metastatic breast cancer patients present a diagnosis with either one or the other of these muscle abnormalities, which is a form of malnutrition. Next slide, please. Now, talking about there's, you know, these are multifactorial mechanisms that, that cause these conditions, but what's important to take from this slide, and it's complicated, but both the tumor and the chemotherapy lead to muscle loss. And cancer therapy itself can lead directly to muscle loss affecting pathways of anabolism and catabolism, but it can also affect the host, like we've heard before, with fatigue, with, with malabsorption, with uh, food intake that is altered, they don't get enough protein. So through the host, you can lead to muscle loss. The tumor itself produces a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines that lead directly through catabolism to muscle loss, insulin resistance, but also through um, hormonal alterations that can lead to muscle loss and, and also leading to more fatty infiltration into the muscle, intramuscular lipid infiltration. So it's a very complicated multi-pathway mechanisms that lead to these conditions. Next slide, please. So here's some evidence, and the next three slides are going to be just very general evidence about the effect of sarcopenia and myostatosis on prognosis and on surgical outcomes. And I can tell you that the field right now in this area is very well established. There's been a lot of reviews, and we're at the point where people are doing meta-analysis of meta-analysis because there's been so many studies. But this is a um, systematic review that was done in approximately 8,000 patients, 38 studies, uh, solid tumors. And what you can see here 
is that there's about a 43% increased risk of death for those who have sarcopenia compared to those who don't. Next slide, please. This is an umbrella study of meta-analysis that has been done with surgical outcomes. And again, you can see here, this is across different cancers at different outcomes. All of the hazard ratios are greater than one and some are the five to six times the risk of those people who have sarcopenia compared to those who don't and having these surgical complications. Next slide, please. And here's a systematic review. Less has been done with myostatosis and prognosis in cancer, but there's still been a lot done. And this is a systematic review and meta-analysis, again, across different cancers, different prognostic outcomes to demonstrate that those with myostatosis have a 75% greater risk than those who do not have myostatosis on having poor cancer prognostic outcomes. So I think that the, the, the evidence is well established in terms of sarcopenia, myostatosis, and poor mortality and poor surgical outcomes. And I think there aren't any gaps in this particular research area in general. But let's talk next slide about some of the research gaps. So even though these papers have many different studies that have used many different methods of measurement, there's still a research gap in how we measure muscle and muscle radiodensity. And we need to pay attention to standardization of methods, to standardization of cut points, standardization of analytic strategies. We need to think about, do we want to benchmark these measures to age, to disentangle age effects from cancer effects? We need to have sex and ethnic specific reference populations. Next slide, please. And here's an example of, of why these bivariate categorizations and definitions maybe imply unrealistic relationships. So I've talked to you about how we define sarcopenia, and here's one cut point uh, for sarcopenia when we look at the uh, skeletal muscle index. And 55 is a common cut point that people use. And so these cut points assume that anybody below 55 has the same risk and everybody above 55 has the same risk. And conversely, someone who has a BMI of 54 has a very different risk than someone with a, a an, excuse me, SMI, not BMI, um, that someone with a SMI less than 54 has a very different risk than someone with an SMI greater than 56. And I think that's just unrealistic. We know that not to be true, that someone who has a, an SMI of 54 is very different than someone who has an SMI of 34. So they're not realistic. And more generally, they obscure these true dose-response relationships. Next slide, please. So what we are moving towards and we think are better are trying to develop these percentile curves and similar to the growth curves in children. And here's an example of something from 12,000 non-cancer patients, outpatient abdominal CT scans. And what they've attempted to do is develop sex and ethnic specific and age specific percentile curves of, in this particular example, is muscle. And what if that allows you to do then as the clinician who has a patient in front of them you can see where that patient should be based on their, their sex, based on their ethnicity, and based on their age. And you can look at what the medium, uh, median percentile is and see if your patient is at the 10% or the, or the 25 percentile. Also, in looking at populations, we can use these percentile curves to do the same thing, to see where the mean of our patients lies. Next slide, please. The last thing I want to say about measurement is all muscle measures are not equivalent. I've been talking mostly about CT, but many of us are using DEXA, and now people are using D3 creatinine mass um, to measure muscle specifically. And you can see here on the left-hand side, the correlations for men are pretty good, but the correlations for females are only very moderate when you look at something like D3 creatinine to DEXA or to CT. So what that's telling us is 
you cannot use these measures interchangeably and think that you're going to be able to diagnose the you know sarcopenia in the same patients with these different methods. So we need to be really careful and pay attention to kind of the methods we're using and what those methods are uh, telling us. Next slide, please. So then the next area that I think is a, a research gap is this prevention and treatment. And there's been quite a few interventions to build muscle um, in cancer patients. There's been fewer to talk about preventing or reversing myostatosis. But even within the interventions that are building muscle, we need to think more about the optimal dosing, the optimal modalities, and the optimal timing. Next slide, please. And here I focus a little bit more on the myostatosis, but here's a slide that says in adults, exercises of different types can in fact decrease lipid infiltration and increase muscle density. And this is across many different kinds of uh, uh, exercise interventions and, and different populations of adults. And so we need to understand more during cancer treatment whether the same thing can be achieved with these types of interventions to affect myostatosis. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about predicting prediction model and improving prediction with the addition of body composition. And <clears throat> excuse me, now that body composition is able to be automated and we can actually integrate it into our healthcare systems, this becomes an important area. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example from my colleagues at the University of Alabama who looked at 410 gastrointestinal cancers and they were able to use some muscle metrics and determine whether or not you could get better predictive modeling if you included these measures. And you can see here that the model A is the baseline model. And if we go to model E, which includes frailty, muscle volume score, and muscle density Z score, we're able to actually in, improve prediction for survival. Next slide. So future research ideas. General large reference populations across diverse populations to disentangle age from cancer uh, related muscle loss and myostatosis, develop these prediction models and incorporate body composition to improve healthcare decision making in cancer patients, develop new exercise and nutrition modalities in cancer patients focused on both simultaneously reducing muscle loss and myostatosis, and then lastly, create large biobanks of both host and tumor specimens and body composition data to better understand mechanisms leading to these muscle abnormalities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for that informative presentation. So next is Dr. Vicki Barakos, who will present on body composition and its evolution in advanced stage cancer, tumor and systematic, I mean, systemic treatment related side effects. You now have the floor, Dr. Barakos. Greetings everyone and thank you. Do I have command of the slide advancement at this point? I'm going to be following on from the uh, presentation of Dr. Betty Khan with whom I wholeheartedly agree on all points that she has raised. I hail from an advanced disease setting. So this is a medical oncology and systemic treatment um, centric setting. And I'm going to um, um, make my disclosures in the first instance. And uh, what I'd like to summarize today is the fabulous opportunity of being able to extract precise specific measures of body composition from standard oncological images. This is a great opportunity exploiting in the best possible way already existing information. Um, this is a great opportunity, but we have a lot of work to do on standards of the standardization of these methods, getting these methods into the hands of practitioners as well as researchers, and in understanding what are the factors contributing to muscle losses and other body composition changes over the course of advanced disease, as well as understanding why body composition seems to associate with the risk of um, toxicity of systemic therapy. 
So my part one is on metrics, measurements, and findings in advanced disease. So my starting place for this was in 2008, having had the inspiration um, or been provided the inspiration by Stephen Heimsfield group to apply these methodologies to standard oncologic imaging. And I'd love to emphasize that this lens on patients with cancer's body composition um, comes with a rather oddball metric, um, which is lumbar body composition indexed at the third lumbar vertebra. There's a reason for that, which is that cancer images are very rarely, if ever, of the whole body. And even if they were, it is impractical due to manual measurement methods to be able to extract this information. So we use um, this convention, but it is not a perfect or ideal or optimized or universally applicable uh, measure of body composition. We live with that. The majority of measures published to date are in these metrics. So once you have these measurements, as Dr. Khan pointed out, you, you discover that patients with cancer of any given sex have a rather wide distribution of muscularity to the point that the least muscular person has less than a third, maybe even only a quarter of the muscle of the most muscular person in any one of these patient population distributions. Now, how you're going to understand or interpret that is another question, but perhaps a plausible premise is that somewhere down at the lower end of the distribution, bad things are going to happen. And so our first launch into this area was taking a, a group of people with obesity and advanced cancer and testing to find that threshold at which the risk of mortality jumps up, giving you the bivariate classification and illustrating its really strong association with mortality in this patient population. The cutoff values solved in this particular paper are amongst the most cited and used, though I would at this point discourage their use because of their potential lack of generalizability across all patient populations. So I'm, I, I like to um, um, agree with Betty again, if you go into any cancer setting, early stage or advanced, you'll find almost complete concordance. And now we have thousands of papers and dozens of meta-analyses which attest to this association between reduced muscle mass and poor prognosis, covering every cancer site and treatment plan imaginable. And, and even conservatively, I would say that in the literature, 100,000 patients have been characterized with these metrics. So I want to speak a little bit about the evolution of these measures in advanced stage disease. So in, in, in my world, spinning forward to 2013, we started to have bigger populations extended to the full range of BMIs and coming out with a, a, a distribution or um, in this example, male L3 skeletal muscle index in advanced cancer setting. And we use this data to solve some more thresholds um, for mortality risk that have also been widely used, um, but for which I'm now uncertain as to whether they are either perfect or entirely meaningful. And that's because we've been able to go on to expand that population um, from hundreds of cases to thousands of cases to come up with a more uh, robust and detailed description of the relative risk of mortality um, the, in the red dots and axis on this plot uh, across that distribution of skeletal muscle index. And given that, first of all, this does jump off hazard ratio of 1.0, it departs um, um, this axis at a certain characteristic place. But because this goes up so steeply um, when across the range of low muscle mass, I'd venture to you that we may consider in the future um, a, a moderate and severe sarcopenia category associated with this very steeply evolving mortality risk. Now, another thing about this 
distribution is we've never had any context uh, in which to place it. And so I'm going to attempt to do that in this slide by um, putting, first of all, in the middle is my original distribution. I have then gone on with this group of actual individuals with that advanced cancer gone out to the end of their disease trajectory, made a measurement and the last scan they had um, before their death, which was at a median of 79 days to come up with the distribution illustrated in gray. So now I know where this trajectory might go. And on the other hand, um, from populations of healthy people having uh, lumbar imaging because they plan on donating their kidney to another person, I have another reference point illustrated on the right-hand side of this figure is the blue distribution. And that I, I find to be, and I would put to you as being helpful to give us an understanding that uh, 30 years of aging, Plus, all the acute and chronic conditions, including cancer, that arrive people at um, a diagnosis of advanced disease might summatively clock about nine units of SMI to have been lost. And further to that, over the course of an incurable malignancy, another about nine units of SMI might be lost overall. And I think one of our challenges now is to go on to try and understand what are the drivers of that loss. So people with advanced cancer in, in routine care, clinical trials, have scans over time. And so that dynamic um, can be measured in almost everybody with a great deal of precision. So I'm going to give you an example from one paper to sort of make a couple of points. So this is a paper about people who were treatment naive and diagnosed with cancers of the head and neck. They had a CT scan. They went on to receive induction chemotherapy followed by concurrent chemoradiotherapy. And they had a scan 200 days later. The mean loss experienced of muscle by those patients is 12.5 units of square centimeters. Please note the huge standard deviation. And this waterfall plot is the individual behavior of people. And here we can see that while almost everyone here experienced mild, moderate, or severe losses of muscle, even um, some persons within this population maintained or gained muscle mass throughout the course of this treatment. Um, we know that our measurement of these are robust in comparison with the measurement error, which is illustrated by the red box. And uh, I, I would report that we really need to now drill down and understand this individually differential behavior and also understand if we can shift more people to the right of this um, outcome loss of muscle mass during treatment. So now I'm going to switch to my theme on treatment, toxicity, and sarcopenia. And I'll present that to you as kind of a vicious circle in which low muscle mass causes toxicity and toxicity causes further reduction of muscle mass. So that muscle wasting was associated with systemic therapy started coming out as early as 2019 in a randomized study with serafinib in renal cell carcinoma. Um, at metastatic stage and also in advanced colorectal cancer in 2016. So people are losing 5, 10, or greater than 10% of muscle mass during a course of therapy. And that was summarized in a review I point you to in 2020, which um, in which you can find a meta-analysis of different treatment plans. And again, I'd emphasize to you that the muscle losses being characterized here are over 100 days, 120, 150, very short periods of time, um, relatively large magnitude losses with a median of 2.7 units of SMI overall, and possibly um, more severe in male and than in female. We'll see how that bears out in future. I'd like to point out that there is a biological plausibility to these, ca these cancer treatment effects. So we had been studying the biology of muscle wasting and the destruction of the myofibrils in terms of signals that were being conveyed by tumors 
and inflama inflammatory molecules induced by tumors. That's a known line of communication. What was not a known line of communication is that many antineoplastic agents enter muscle cells, so such as these categories that are anti-proliferative, and what do they do? They block proliferation in muscle cells in as much as they do in cancer cells and other tissues. Also, a whole host of antineoplastics of a um, uh, cytotoxic nature have been shown to activate a transcriptional catastrophe that results in disruption and destruction of the myofibrillar structures. So that's one side of the story. Now, here's something about the association between cancer treatment toxicity and sarcopenia. So I'd like to start out by telling you that there are about 40 small, retrospective, univariable, low-quality studies that suggest that there is such an association. By this slide, I want to mention to you that I think we're getting more evidence about this, that it's a bit better quality insofar as it might be including multivariable analyses, and has the words sarcopenia and high-grade adverse events um, as the main outcomes. So this is something I feel we need to understand, and the manner in which we need to understand it in particular is in relation to the patient's exposure that's to say their pharmacokinetic, pharmacokinetics, their maximum concentration clearance and area under the time concentration curve, which describes their exposure to antineoplastics. We have very little of this evidence, but I like very much this small paper um, um, from 2012 in which we learned that patients with um, um, hepatocellular carcinoma treated with serafinib um, had much higher all toxicities, every toxicities, specific toxicities, and a pharmacokinetic result that would explain that, which is a doubled area under the time concentration curve. If we are ever to modify cancer patients' treatment doses um, in function of their body composition, this is the type of evidence, pharmacokinetics, evidence that we need to adjust doses. Now, I'd like to point out to you that it's a mistake to regard that as a simple question of sarcopenia equals toxicity, and then you can go home and understand everything. And I'd make that point in this fashion. Here's three persons of the same sex diagnosis who will all receive the same cancer therapy. They are equally sarcopenic to one another but they would have, owing to their very different fat mass, very different overall body weights. Now, many cancer therapies are administered in proportion to body weight or a metric derived from body weight, such as the body surface area. So here you can understand that in different people, all of whom have sarcopenia, the high body weight is going to inflate the dose of chemotherapy. So indeed, perhaps sarcopenic obese patients may be a very specific at-risk group for such severe toxicity. So we don't have the evidence required to dose modify, um, but I'd like to point out to you that um, an ASCO guideline update published in 20. Um, 21 addresses this point, stating that it remains premature to make recommendations on empiric body composition-based dose modifications, but that body composition analysis should be um, a consideration in, in the assessment of patients beginning tra cancer treatments and in clinical trials. Um, so I will just close there by, by saying that the um, L3 body composition has strengths and limitations. Um, advanced disease patients arrive with substantial depletion. Greater depletion equals worse outcome. And we have a unique interplay between body composition and toxicity of systemic therapy that we very much need to further understand. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you, Dr. Barracos, for your presentation on body composition and treatment related side effects. Our next presenter is Dr. Wendy DeMarc Wanafried. She, she will present on weight loss and dietary interventions during cancer treatment. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks so much, Keisha. And it's really a great honor to be part of this workshop. And these are all very hard acts to follow, but I'll try my best. I've been uh, tasked with covering weight loss and dietary interventions during cancer treatment. And I have no disclosures and I am waiting for my slides to advance. And they are not advancing. This is very weird. Uh, we have a delay going on. Would you like me to take back presenter and then I'll. Oh. Uh, uh, is that it? Yep. Disclosure I, I, statement. Okay. I'm going to thank you so much. So Good. where are we now? Um, the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research uh, in their 2018 report uh, suggested that there was limited suggestive evidence that body fatness increases all cause mortality within 12 months of a cancer diagnosis. And that's really uh, pointing to during this time of treatment. However, even though they say this, this is more of an uh, indicator of uh, the prognostic effect of uh, increased adiposity, not necessarily what we should do with it once we find it in our patients. And again, it's only in one cancer. I'm gonna flip over to the, to the um, right, uh, right side of my screen and really kind of talk about what the American Cancer Society recommended in their, two, uh, in their recommendations that were just released a few months ago. And here they say nutritional assessment and counseling should begin as soon as possible after diagnosis. And what they're really after is to prevent, uh, uh, avoid nutrition de uh, deficiencies, preserve muscle mass, uh, tolerate and respond to treatment, um, and manage some of the side effects. So not necessarily on the cancer per se. The um, uh, ASCO also released uh, their uh, recommendations during treatment. They reviewed, uh, and I was part of this, many people that are on this workshop were part of this. We reviewed the uh, evidence of studies that were done that were more than 25 patients per arm. Uh, and there was a, uh, quite a bit of evidence for exercise, which Ann McTiernan's gonna cover in the next session. Uh, however, for diet, it was all across the board. And, um, and hence, you know, I think Helen Parsons has given a, us a good review of that work. Uh, and basically, when we're talking about, about diet during this time of a treatment, there is a lack of evidence. Uh, in this area to really inform us. Perhaps the only thing that only thing that came out of this review with regard to diet was the lack of evidence for neutropenic diets and a, and really the recommendation that that those not be endorsed during the time of treatment because they're limiting and uh, really could limit the consumption of fruits and vegetables, which may be helpful. Um, the panel did not discourage uh, clinicians from discussing he healthy diet and weight with their patients, but refrained from making um, more recommendations than that. So what are the practices of cancer survivors? Karen Collins alluded to this, uh, and there was really um, a nice review that was done by Telosa a few years ago. And what they found was that uh, most cancer survivors have overweight or obesity. Most follow a low fiber diet. Most eat less than five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Most eat a high saturated fat, high fat diet. And most do not follow the recommendations for limiting red and processed meats. Um, a very, uh, a, a select minority, now, well, I won't say that you still see a sizable portion that uh, exceed the moderate uh, alcohol intake recommendation. So there is a heck of a lot of work to do in this area and cancer survivors are a population in need. Not only that, they are also eager to find out more information about diet and exercise. As Michael Pollack pointed out uh, yesterday, the uh, cancer survivors or cancer patients come forth with many questions about diet and exercise. 
that we are unable to answer at this time, primarily diet. So I had the pleasure of writing this, Riding the Crest of the Teachable Moment with Julia Rowland several, several years ago, uh, that really pointed to the fact that a teachable moment is uh, inherent with a cancer diagnosis and that we really need to fill the void here in uh, being able to respond to patients' crying needs that they really do want more uh, guidance in this area. So uh, what is their interest in lifestyle guidance? Again, several years ago, we published a, a, a report of a survey of 988 breast and prostate cancer survivors, and I had really hoped that more studies would have been done in this area between now and, uh, and then. Uh, however, back then we found that 80% of uh, cancer patients were interested in diet and about the same amount interested in exercise. A significantly smaller population was interested in smoking cessation, and fortunately that's because fewer of the patients did smoke. Um, a more recent review that was done in uh, childhood cancer survivors finds similar statistics with regard to diet, exercise, and then also uh, weight management. So there, again, there is huge interest in this area. So, um, but uh, the oncologists are not necessarily given uh, advice in this area. When we reported about two decades ago, roughly a third of the oncologists were informing their patients of, of um, uh, diet and exercise. This has increased, fortunately, in the intervening years with, you see, the 46% uh, percent of oncologists talked about weight management in uh, younger cancer survivors, as well as 60% uh, received dietary guidance from their oncologists. There also is a article by uh, uh, um, Havilova that was reported in 2019 that shows that roughly 50% of oncologists are talking to adult cancer survivors in this area. So what's the optimal time to intervene? Now, this kind of gets back to the teachable moment of cancer. Um, in our study, we found that the optimal time to intervene was at diagnosis or soon after where the majority of adult cancer survivors are saying, I want the information, I want it right after diagnosis, and it tails off over time. Um, in teenage and young adult cancer survivors, Pew in their uh, survey, found that most, can most t uh, younger cancer survivors pointed to the time right after their treatment uh, as the most opportune time to intervene. Um, Anne is going to present about physical activity, and um, which does present a, a, a challenge in, being know, in knowing what to do during the time of diagnosis, but diet is even more challenging. Uh, again, we've heard a lot from Helen Parsons over the past three days, and it's really been illuminating on how uh, little we do know. Um, Physical activity is fairly easy. You have aerobic, strength training, flexibility, and balance. I don't want to minimize it, but it, when we're talking about diet, diet is, diet is made up of food. Food is made up of various compositions of nutrients as well as their various isomers. However, uh, this is even more of a challenge because it's more than that. Uh, we need to talk about t dietary patterns. We have to talk about uh, drug nutrient interactions, absorption, food preparation, food contaminants. Uh, it is a far more complex issue and it's very difficult to get our hands around it. Um, in closing, I, I just want to point out uh, because there is uh, very little known uh, during this uh, during the time of treatment, and what do we do about weight loss? Uh, I know that uh, we did one of the studies that kind of fell underneath the radar, looking at pre-surgical weight loss in men that were scheduled for prostatectomy. The reason why it fell under the radar, it was a fairly small study. 40 overweight and obese, uh, 40 uh, men with obesity and overweight who were scheduled for surgery for their prostate cancer. 
where we got where we basically recruited them, took all kinds of measures, randomized them to an attention control arm where we intervened on them to um, increase their um, to improve their diet deficiencies versus an arm that not only intervened on that, but that also promoted active weight loss, two pounds per week with diet and exercise. And then we followed up uh, these men and really looked at their uh, tumors uh, in looking at KI-67 and how fast that tumor was proliferating. And that was our primary endpoint. Um, our hypothesis was that uh, weight loss would actually slow down tumor proliferation. Uh, and in a sensitivity analysis, we ended up, um, because there was a lot of drop in in this study, uh, we did, uh, we didn't, we not only looked at our results by arm, but also did a sensitivity analysis. And what we found is that the men who uh, lost weight uh, of one and a half pounds per week or greater, uh, versus the men that lost uh, 69, uh, basically 0.69 pounds or less, had much different profiles with regard to their tumor. Uh, that really, uh, that, that was in direct con contradiction to what we had, had hypothesized. You see here that the men here, actually their tumors increased when we put them, when they were following the more severe calorie restriction. Uh, whereas the men that uh, lost weight at a very slower uh, rate actually decreased their tumor proliferation. So weight loss seems beneficial, but only if it was pursued in a much less rapid fashion. And so um, this was not only found in our uh, find it our in our study, but also the Aronson Group in UCLA confirm these findings, which makes it, um, which really does uh, indicate that this requires more follow-up. Um, and in this study that we had, um, again, uh, the um, KI-67 rate was significantly lower in our, um, uh, or significantly, yes, actually, let me rephrase that, significantly higher in the group that we actively intervened and tried to get them to lose more weight quicker. Not only that, we were able to do gene expression studies of the tumor. And while we found some very nice uh, increases in immune response uh, markers, that were um, that that happened with weight loss and exercise. Um, what we what really kind of took us aback was these uh, markers that were upregulated that really mapped to um, higher proliferation rates, uh, as well as uh, uh, CTSL, cathepsin L, which is a protein that's expressed uh, in sarcopenia. So the, the question is, is once we have weight loss going here, if we promote weight loss too quickly, uh, and that could actually, I mean, is this a switch that we can turn off or are we going to really kind of fast track people into a state of cachexia? So it's, um, it is uh, very concerning and uh, uh, an issue that we really do need to follow up on more. So knowledge gaps and research summary. We need to find out the optimal timing of dietary interventions. Is it in the neoadjuvant setting? Is it post-surgery? Uh, uh, do we have to time it with regard to chemotherapy cycle? Uh, we need to find out the impact of intentional weight loss on cancer outcomes. Uh, and, um, and how do we combine uh, diet with exercise in that regard? We'd have to find out more about cancer treatment and nutrient needs and nutrient, nutritional status and the impact of dietary patterns, macronutrient dis distribution, functional foods on all of these outcomes. So finally, my last slide, key recommendations. Uh, this cancer presents a teachable moment and we have an opportunity here to really provide patients with the information that they really do want. However, we do not have the data at present to really inform them. 
Um, however, a point that was brought up by Nigel uh, Brockton is that, well, gee, at least you could really reinforce the uh, dietary recommendations. We know that those probably don't cause any harm. However, we really don't know what to do as far as functional foods go, and we don't know what to do about weight loss. Um, and the other points that I brought here really have been uh, covered by other speakers, but I do want to go into the very last point, which is we need to develop a research enterprise that prioritizes research in key areas. For example, the, the uh, issue that Michael Pollack brought forward yesterday about dextrose in IVs is an answerable and ac um, actionable uh, research question that really could be investigated fairly easily. Uh, and we also have to use smart designs. I mean, this in nutrition, where there are so many factors, we need to be able to roll these out in a, uh, in a fashion that is efficient and thoughtful, rather than a study here, a study there, and, and trying to make sense out of it all. We also need to, do, to really uh, bank on distance medicine-based approaches that can increase uh, efficiency, as well as get diversity into our, um, into our studies, because right now that is lacking totally. And with that, I am going to hand it uh, off to Keisha. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wanna, for, for that wonderful presentation. We will now take a, a, a break to prepare for the next part of our workshop to help us keep up with the time, there's gonna be a countdown clock on the screen. We ask that you please return so that we can uh, continue our discussion of key question four. So I'm gonna ask folks if we can come back in five minutes versus 10, we're a little bit behind. So wanna catch us up a little bit. Um, so see you in five minutes.
All righty, welcome back everyone. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone joining us from the Pacific time zones. We hope you have some time to stretch your legs briefly and that you're ready to hear from our next speaker. Up next is Dr. Ann McTiernan with a talk on exercise before and during cancer treatment. You may begin Dr. McTiernan. I think you're muted. Did you want to drive your slides or would you like me to flip through them for you? I, I would like to drive them. Do I just use this arrow uh, here? I'm going to make you presenter first. Thank you. Here it comes. And you know where to find the controls? Yes, thank you. All righty, great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to be talking on exercise before and during cancer treatment. Um, I have no information to disclose. Um, and what I want to talk about are um, an overview of research that has been done in this area. And luckily, the American Society for Cl Clinical Oncology recently published guidelines. Um, and this is a panel um, of um, experts um, that wrote these and um, Dr. Um, Wannefred was on this panel. Um, so it, we really appreciate what they, um, the work they put into this. And what they, they first had a question for related to physical activity. They asked for adult patients with cancer undergoing active treatment with systemic antineoplastic therapy or radiotherapy who are, or who are in the perioperative period does exercise safely improve outcomes <clears throat> related to quality of life, treatment, toxicity, or cancer control? <clears throat> and what they conducted was a systematic review of systematic review of randomized control trials. Um, and they came up with recommendations. And I'll give more a little more of the evidence um, after this slide, but I wanted to give you the bottom line. First, their recommendations are that oncology providers should recommend aerobic and resistance exercise during active treatment with curative intent to mitigate side effects of cancer treatments. Um, and they, they um, list the type of evidence that they believe this um, rises to based on um, criteria that American Society for Clinical Oncology uses for all their guidelines. Um, but they also um, said that oncology providers may recommend preoperative exercise for patients undergoing surgery for lung cancer to reduce the length of hospital stay and postoperative complications. Um, and again, provide the type of evidence that they believe this rises to. This does not mean that there, weren't, there isn't evidence for other um, outcomes, and I'll talk about those um, during the rest of the talk. But this is what they summarized, and I give the reference here. Um, so during treatment, for exercise during treatment, their systematic review consisted of 42 systematic reviews and, and some additional randomized trials that were published after the last review. The nature of systematic reviews is that there's a great deal of overlap of studies that are in them. So um, over time, um, as more studies are done in the field, the systematic reviews are going to get larger. Um, but still, it's very useful to look at all of the systematic reviews in one when coming up with the state of science and coming up with guidelines. And what the um, what the systematic reviews overall showed was that um, their meta analysis, that is, adding together results from multiple studies, showed benefit beneficial effects during treatment with chemotherapy, radiation, or hormonal therapy for these endpoints that I've listed here. Um, so that they're talking about ex aerobic exercise with or without resistance exercise. Um, aerobic being things like walking and biking um, or using a, um, a equipment where you're getting your heart rate up. Um, resistance exercise meaning strength training. Um, that these studies were done in either, either study had uh, multiple types of cancers in the study, or it focused on breast, colorectal, lung, prostate, or um, hematologic, which is blood cancers. 
Um, and the, what they found overall is that there was improvement in fatigue and cardiopulmonary fitness in a six minute walk test, which is just what it sounds like. How far can a patient walk in six minutes? Um, in improvement in physical function, both in self-reported and measured, improvement in quality of life, and in breast cancer, it's been found to in, improve depression, anxiety, and sleep. Now, depression, anxiety doesn't mean that this is going to be a cure for it. It means it can be helpful. Um, they looked at other endpoints, these meta-analyses, these systematic reviews, um, and they found some benefit in some studies and not at others. And that's in looking at body composition, muscle strength, cognitive function, chemotherapy completion, which is a key measure to be looking at um, because people who are able to complete their chemotherapy tend to do better. Very little information on cancer control, meaning effects on recurrence or survival, and not much information on adverse events. The studies that did report it um, showed very low rates, um, but most of those studies were <clears throat> with supervised exercise. So somebody in a gym with an exercise expert um, and they did not um, address adverse events either in the home or community facilities. Um, and studies of high-risk patients have not been identified. So that means high-risk patients who are taking chemotherapy drugs that are toxic to the heart or patients with underlying conditions like underlying heart disease. <clears throat> and trial eligibility might be excluding high-risk patients. So we, these studies didn't address that issue. What about patients with advanced cancer? There have been very few studies on the feasibility, safety, or potential benefits of exercise. Um, <clears throat> there was additional um, um, systematic review with 17 trials, including patients with bone metastases that showed some benefit, such as physical function. And again, serious events were rare. So I provided the, revenant, the, um, the uh, some references there as well. Um, a meta-analysis of six randomized trials showed that patients with advanced lung cancer um, show some improvement in that six-meter walk test and also in um, global health-related um, quality of life. Um, and from this, ASCO, American Society for Clinical Oncology, concluded that this preliminary support for the safety of exercise in advanced cancer, but more work is needed. Um, some issues to consider um, are that cancer symptoms and medical care induce sedentariness. Um, so we heard from two people earlier today that are dealing with cancer. They have considerable symptoms um, and that um, in, in many patients can reduce their ability to exercise or their interest in exercising. And that can include fatigue, pain, shortness of breath, neuropathy, Certainly muscle wasting, a lot of information today about that. Um, just think of the treatments that patients go through. They have to travel to treatment, they're waiting, they're in clinic, they're waiting for tests, they're waiting for infusion, then they have their infusion, and then they have um, potential fatigue afterwards. So we're, the medical care is building more sedentary-ness into um, patients and that um, to compete with their time available to exercise. And add to that, many patients still are working and they just may not have the time. Um, there are some medical treatments that may interfere with the exercise capability or safety, that meaning the, the cancer treatments, and I've listed quite a few here, <clears throat> such as the fatigue, cardiotoxic drugs, um, radiotherapy can affect the heart or lung. Um, patients have um, blood cell issues, neutropenia, anemia, or thrombocytopenia. They can have prolifer peripheral neuropathy, which can affect some ability to exercise. They can have central neuropathy, causing balance problems or vertigo. And certainly can have musculoskeletal effects that can affect their exercise ability. Um, and then may they may have underlying medical issues that can affect capability or safety. Um, we, we've heard a lot about obesity today. Um, most of the studies in the, that have, in the general population um, on exercise have been geared to people that don't have obesity. So this is something that's going to 
filter over into trials in the cancer population as well. So it's an important population needs to be studied. But also people with frailty, cancer is a disease that occurs often um, in older individuals who may have frailty, may have other chronic diseases, um, may have musculoskeletal or cardi um, cardiopulmonary fitness issues, and may take medications that can affect their um, ability to exercise. Um, there, there was a systematic review looking at exercise prior to surgery. Um, there have been 21 randomized controls trials um, and um, in this meta-analysis. Um, and um, it, one thing that these, this meta-analysis showed a very high interest in agreeing to participate in those studies, 88 to 90 percent um, agreed to participate and 90 percent completed them. Um, and this is in a population with an average age of 67. Um, so what this tells us is that um, patients may be receptive before they're going to surgery if they have an idea that exercise could help them. Um, these, this trial showed that, these trials, sorry, showed that exercise can improve cardiopulmonary fitness can improve the six minute walk test, even in the short period between diagnosis and getting cancer therapy, uh, surgery. I'm gonna show here, um, these are my two slides on data from a cohort study in breast cancer survivors. And these were patients who were stage um, zero to 3A. We asked them, uh, when they entered our study, so they were between diagnosis and one year out from diagnosis, we asked them what exercise they were doing at that time, a detailed interview. We also asked what they did before diagnosis and what, and then followed them and asked them again at three years. And you see that there's a slight drip, dip in, this is total amount of exercise, including household exercise uh, and light physical activity. So all of these went down a little bit. Um, and between pre-diagnosis and um, um, the time around diagnosis, and then went up quite a bit by three years. Um, and, but when you look at moderate intensity exercise, which is what we mostly want people to be doing, that was low to begin with, went down even more, and only went up a little bit at three years. So what about implementing? There are guidelines available for um, for oncology groups, for um, patients. Um, American Society for Clinical Oncology has guidelines now. The American College of Sports Medicine has special guidelines for cancer patients and survivors. There's a certification for exercise specialists. Um, many communities have um, community-based um, programs. This picture here is a group of women cancer survivors um, who meet together that call Cancer Survivors Northwest, or Team Survivors Northwest. Um, and this is a, a class of survivors that's using an indoor gym. So oncology and oncologist involvement is gonna be critical because um, um, patients do vary in their ability to exercise and the safety issues for them. Um, but my um, belief is that cost has to be free to patients because of the um, very toxic amount of costs that patients are paying for their other treatments, I would um, hope that cancer um, patients could have access to free or very low cost of, uh, for exercise programs. And then I'm with some cancer, uh, so, some knowledge gaps, and I've mentioned them as we go along, but a home exercise programs that um, it can be cost free and adaptable would be very helpful. And so testing those would be um, a priority. Identifying patients who need physical therapy oversight, um, including <clears throat> data on exercise during treatment for patients with other cancers and not just the ones that have been studied so much. Um, most of the prehab studies examine lung cancer, so looking at prehab um, exercise for other cancer patients would be um, helpful. And then we don't know about the effects of exercise on therapeutic efficacy. Does exercise help people um, get more of their chemotherapy 
and um, deal with the chemotherapy side effects. So finishing up some key recommendations, looking at unsupervised home-based exercise, outdoor exercise programs, using technology to help with adherence, effectiveness, and safety, and with cost, looking at different types, intensity, and frequency of exercise, um, looking at exercise in understudied cancers, looking in patients from diverse groups. Most of the studies have been in um, patients who were not the oldest groups and not the youngest groups. Um, most have been in white individuals from urban areas. So we really need information in diverse populations. Um, and looking on uh, trials and patients on immunotherapies, the, the newest types of therapies, and patients with advanced disease. And then um, also looking at large scale trial statistics effects on recurrence and survival. Um, we also need to uh, have um, studies to develop and test implementation strategies that are tailored for specific patients um, and oncology treatment centers settings, and then develop guidelines for those clinicians and me medical systems. Thank you. Dr. McTiernan, thank you for your informative presentation. The final presentation for key question four is from Dr. Helena Ferberg on the topic, investigating the BMI paradox in kidney cancer. I turn it over to you, Dr. Ferberg. Thank you. Did you want to drive your slides or would you like me? Um, I think I can do it. Okay, let me make you a presenter first. Great. Should be coming your way. Hope there's not too much of a lag. Okay. Looks good. You can uh, start your talk. Um, okay, I'm trying to go forward, but it's not. Yeah, we we had a bit of a lag before as well. You can go ahead and drive if that's easier. Okay, I'm sorry about that. That's just no the technology. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, your next slide, please. I have no information to s disclose. The, the work that I'm going to present today is funded by the NCI, a Department of Defense grant, and the American Institute for Cancer Research. So today I'm going to talk to you about the BMI paradox, a little bit of a, a shift, um, uh, but I think relates also to the other presentations that we've heard today. This is specifically in kidney cancer where I do my research. Um, and I'd like to start by just defining what the BMI paradox is, and it's the observation that high BMI increases the risk of developing kidney cancer, but appears to confer a survival advantage in clinical studies. Next slide. I think the knowledge gap says it relates to the BMI paradox are the following. So, first of all, how should we interpret it? Does it is it a causal association? Should we automatically fatten up patients to extend survival, or is it more nuanced than, than that? And are there underlying methodologic considerations that we have to factor in? What exactly does high BMI represent? Um, we've, we've seen from several presenters that um, you can get more specific information from body composition assessment and that someone of the same BMI could have totally different body composition features. I also um, think it's important to unpack the molecular underpinnings of the BMI paradox, and I'll present some of that work to you today. And I think ultimately in answering some of these questions, um, the hope is to modify body size through nutritional, behavioral, pharmacological interventions to optimize clinical outcomes. Next slide, please. And I'd first like to just get you familiar with kidney cancer. It's a little bit different than a lot of other more common solid tumors like breast, prostate, or colorectal. Um, it's the eighth most common cancer in the U.S. The incidence has been increasing over the past few decades. It seems to be flattening out now. There's been a stage migration, which means that smaller tumors are being diagnosed. And what's notable about kidney cancer compared to others is that 75% of patients are diagnosed incidentally. So that means they had no idea that they had the disease. They didn't have um, uh, pre-diagnosis weight loss or flank pain or anything like that. They got imaged for something unrelated like um, a car accident or something, and then they found a mass in their tumor, I mean, a mass in their kidney, which turned out to be kidney cancer. 
The most common and lethal histologic subtype, which is the one that I'm focused on studying, is clear cell renal cell carcinoma. It's a male predominant disease. It's also more common in Caucasians than other racial and ethnic groups. And it's a heterogeneous disease that is characterized by alterations in angiogenic, immunologic, and metabolic pathways. Next slide. The other thing that makes kidney cancer an interesting and, and unique disease to study is that it's chemotherapy and radiation resistant. So we heard from Dr. Barakos that chemotherapy is a very um, uh, strong inducer of, of muscle wasting. Um, in kidney cancer, chemotherapy is not given. Instead, the, uh, the treatment options are pretty limited. So for non-metastatic patients, uh, nephrectomy or surgical resection of the tumor is only offered. But for metastatic patients, there are targeted therapies such as VEGF and mTOR inhibitors, and most recently immunotherapies um, are now offered to patients. And I should mention that um, serafinib, which was one of the, um, the drugs that Dr. Barrick has also mentioned, that is also known to induce muscle wasting. So, in thinking about weight loss and body size in the context of kidney cancer for metastatic patients, it's it's important to think about what patients have have received if they're not getting it in the first line setting. Next slide. So as I mentioned, BMI is an established risk factor for getting kidney cancer for both men and women. It increases risk by about thirty percent. Next slide. And this shows the putative mechanisms through which obesity could increase risk of kidney cancer. And um, because all of these all of these pathways can adversely impact health, this is renal hypoxia, systemic inflammatory response, dysregulation of adipokines, um, uh, to, you know all these different um, tumor promoting um, properties. You would think that having a high BMI. Um, uh, at the time that you're diagnosed with kidney cancer would confer a worse prognosis. So next slide, please. But what we see is the opposite. This is a meta-analysis from 2013 of 15 studies, including over 12,000 kidney cancer patients. And here I'm just showing that both the overall mortality and cancer-specific mortality, the hazard ratio is less than one. This is comparing obese to normal weight patients, suggesting that a lower mortality risk in patients who are obese compared to those that are normal weight at the time of diagnosis. Next slide, please. This has also more recently been observed in the context of immunotherapy. So this is a meta-analysis from 2022. It includes eight different studies of, of um, metastatic patients, kidney cancer patients treated with immunotherapies, so over 2,000 patients. And again, we're seeing that if you're obese or overweight compared to those who are normal weight, you have a survival advantage or a lower mortality risk. Next slide. So the question is, why do patients with high BMI do better? So remember, this is, this is now everybody has the disease and you're contrasting people with high BMI to people who have lower BMIs or are classified as normal weight. So one idea that's been put forth is that it may, as we've talked about and learned about over several days, that there might be some advantage to have some excess weight or nutritional reserve. It may be beneficial in the context of a metabolic disease like kidney cancer. There's also the possibility that obesity-associated systemic inflammation may actually improve immunotherapy treatment efficacy just based on how the drugs work. But this, the part that um, I've been mainly focused on studying is trying to understand if there are tumor-related differences that are developing in the obesogenic environment, which may differ from those of normal weight patients. Next slide. So over the past few years, um, we have looked at, um, or more than years, it started in 2013, we published a study um, in predominantly localized kidney cancer patients. Um, that showed the BMI paradox, and then we started looking at gene expression differences at the time of diagnosis and, um, and correlating that with BMI to try to understand um, differences. We followed it up with a study in 2016 in JCO, this time in patients treated with targeted therapies, so metastatic patients. And then finally, most recently in Lancet Oncology, we had a paper investigating transcriptomic signatures of the obesity paradox in patients treated with immunotherapy. Next slide, please. 
so um, one of the main sort of take home messages, you know, of, of our work over the years is that there are um, significant tumor gene expression differences by BMI. And one thing that we found and validated across different cohorts was the involvement of a gene or the difference in expression of a gene called fatty acid synthase. This is a metabolic oncogene. It drives tumor progression. It turns out that FASN was down-regulated in the tumors of our obese patients and up-regulated in the tumors of normal weight. And FASN up-regulation is associated with worse survival. So that's shown in a slide here of the yellow are the normal weight patients who have higher FASN expression levels, but then worse survival. Next slide, please. And then similarly, we found that, um, well, not similarly, I guess that the, uh, we, we found that another pathway that was differentially expressed was in the angiogenic pathway. So we, here we found that the angiogenic pathways were actually upregulated in the tumors of obese. And this is important because TKI treatments, the targeted treatment treatments that I mentioned earlier, they go after angiogenic pathways and, and genes. So obese patients, if they harbor more of these pathways, um, that there's more the, to the drugs um, to work on. And that's, uh, these are just two slides showing um, in two different cohorts that we're seeing the same upregulation of angiogenic factors in obese as compared to normal weight patients. Next slide, please. The, um, in terms of the literature where it stands, there's an, it's an active area of research um, to investigate immune related differences by BMI. Um, we did not find that the tumors showed any differential gene expression by BMI, but um, we did find that there were gene expression differences in immune infiltrations in the perinephric fat from obese patients compared to normal weight. So that suggests the tumor microenvironment is involved, not just the tumor. Um, this was different from Wang et al., who published a paper showing that there was heightened immune dysfunction in the tumors of obese melanoma patients. And then Gibson, who did conduct a study in renal cell um, uh, patients did not find any changes um, in both the systemic or the local tumor microenvironment, but this is an, an active area of research, so it's, it's really not clear what's going on with immune-related changes. Next slide, please. I think all of this um, to date suggests the BMI paradox has a biological basis, so it's not just a spurious finding that is driven by methodologic weaknesses. I think that our results and, and those of others have shown that non-metastatic patients with um, high BMI may survive longer because they harbor, le harbor less aggressive tumors. Metastatic patients with high BMI may do better on treatment because their uh, tumors have an upregulation in the very pathways that the treatment targets. And then a really important thing um, is that um, instead of focusing on why is BMI so high BMI so advantageous, let's fatten up our patients, I think we need to focus more on this other group who's not doing so well, which are the normal weight patients, and they may not actually be so normal or healthy. And for this, we can turn to body composition to clarify what high BMI represents. Next slide. So we've seen throughout the talk that this is these are two kidney cancer patients. CTs are taken as part of routine clinical care, so it's very convenient modality to figure out body comp assessment. Next slide. And what's um, emerged um, sort of more recently is that uh, skeletal muscle in particular seems to be the body composition feature that is um, very much related to prognosis. And um, whereas visceral adiposity and subcutaneous adiposity are, are inconsistently associated, but of course, you know, sarcopenic obesity or, or um, combinations of variables are also potentially important. But so far, most of the literature is suggesting that skeletal muscle mass and myosteatosis are the more relevant um, tissues in terms of kidney cancer prognosis. Next slide. We are following this up. Um, we're in year four of an NCI-funded R01 molecular epi study, and we have over 1,200 non-metastatic clear cell patients. We're doing a sub-analysis in a, a side cohort of 250 metastatic clear cell patients treated with immunotherapy. We're interpreting their CTs for body composition. We're doing transcriptomic profiling of archived tumor tissue using a nanostring array. And then we're analyzing associations with clinical outcomes so that we can try to understand to what degree tumor biology is influencing the association between some of these body composition features and outcomes. And I think that um, 
At this point, our, our analyses highlight the importance of muscle. Um, just in terms of the interim analyses we've done, we're, we're seeing the same patterns that are previously reported and that um, the poor muscle health is associated with aggressive tumor biology. Um, and I think in general, this, this leads me to think that body composition could be a subclinical marker of tumor aggressiveness, because what we're doing is studying it at the time of diagnosis and there's no, um, it, and all of our specimens are, are treatment naive. So there's no pre treatment wasting um, um, or anything like that that's affecting our tumor samples. Next slide. I think the key recommendations about where to go next is that um, we have to recognize that uh, at this point, I'm only considering body composition at the time of diagnosis, and it's critical to talk about how what's going on with the patient before diagnosis and after and how that influences clinical outcomes. We need to continue our characterization of molecular features. And at this point, since their analyses are cross-sectional, it's not clear whether low muscle, for example, is a cause or a consequence of aggressive tumors. And then finally, um, if body composition is a subclinical marker of tumor aggressiveness, uh, it might help us in risk stratifying patients for specific treatments. So should patients with certain body composition features get specific treatment types? And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ferber. Thank you for that dynamic presentation on the BMI paradox in kidney cancer. We now will invite all speakers for the key question for a session to join Dr. Hyatt for the discussion and Q&A session by turning on your cameras. Dr. Hyatt, you may begin. Great, thank you, Keisha. So, uh, yeah, wow, a lot of great uh, presentations, a lot of good information. Um, we have just short of 40 minutes for uh, questions. And uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, my panel members, all, all seven of them, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, ask any questions they have first. And then we'll go to questions that have come from the audience, uh, of which there are many. And uh, let me say to start with that if we don't get to all the questions coming from the audience, they will still be useful to us uh, and we'll try to get them answered um, uh, in the course of the conference. So, um, first of all, any questions from our, our panel for these uh, four excellent uh, presenters? May, may I ask a general question to everybody, which is, Anyone listening to these presentations might be formulating the following question in their head. Um, is a given person too heavy or not heavy enough? Um, so we're hearing news about um, potentially being heavy in a way that associates with a, a risk of getting cancer in the first place. And then uh, heaviness that associates with a, actually a better outcome of a cancer once diagnosed. So somebody going along that pathway um, might be asking the question, um, the, there's a tipping point in here. I, I, I wrote this question in the chat addressing it to Helena in the first instance, but um, how can we navigate that transition um, in a well understood and clear way for our audiences? So uh, th thank you for that. Uh, the question, um, does seem to be best answered by Dr. Ferberg to start with, but maybe you can try to answer that and, and then try to generalize it. When do you tell people uh, to to shift their uh, emphasis on on their weight? You're you're muted. Thanks. Yeah, that's an incredibly important question. Um, I um, it's interesting because. I'm coming, I'm working at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And when we first did these results, put these results out, all of the clinicians, um, none of them were, were worried about not telling their patients to lose weight. Instead, they were, um, they were thinking more about kind of fattening people up to improve their survival. So they're kind of coming at it. They're focusing on, on a different, they're not telling the heavy people to lose weight. They're telling the normal weight people they're wondering if maybe they should be gaining weight. So there's there's that wrinkle in there as well. Um, there was a new paper that just came out looking at um, the trajectory of, of weight um, 
prior to diagnosis of the nurse's health study and in kidney cancer specifically. And what they found was um, I, it, it's, it's too, it's misleading or it's not full enough to um, only focus on BMI at the time of diagnosis, but you need to factor in what's going on before and after, because like you're saying, they are on this trajectory. Um, and, uh, and what they showed was that that patients who are losing weight are the ones that are um, um, the ones that are doing doing worse. So there, there's some kind of pre-cotectic phenotype, even in localized disease. Um, so I, I I don't know if that's really what you're 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 talking about, but I think that I think it's I think our obesity paradox research suggests that our emphasis should really be on the normal weight group and trying to understand what's happening to them. And it could be aggressive tumor biology is inducing wasting and then they're on this cascade and they need to be managed differently as opposed to should we help the heavier people lose weight since they're doing better? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit fuzzy. So uh, it's uh, also a true statement that nobody um, has access to a diagnosis of how muscular they are in day-to-day -day practice right now, which mm -hmm. is a, a real limitation. Uh, Wendy, did you want to uh, comment yeah, on I, that? I think it's not, you know, I, I think maybe classifying people at these various snapshots at in time is not as important as what you say the trajectory is. So um, it, uh, so just focusing on normal weight people may steer us in the wrong direction because sure. truly those normal weight people may have started off as obese and experienced, yep. um, <clears throat> you know, uh, non-intentional weight loss. Uh, and, you know, here we, here they are, they're, you know, they still may be over in the overweight range. Uh, yet they, you know, it's their trajectory, which really signals the, um, whether they're at risk or not. So, yeah. um, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I see a question from, uh, Dr. Collins hand raised. Following up on some of the earlier work, um, the, Dr. Demac Wanafried and, and others were talking about in terms of potential benefit of weight loss in, in other cancers um, and looking at how we can address the research gap. Are there, are there biomarkers, either um, markers of proliferation like KI-67 or, or insulin or hormones or something that could be an interim indicator of um, whether in certain populations weight loss was going to be uh, beneficial? Or where are we with that? Well, <clears throat> hi, Karen. Uh, I, I'll, I'll jump into that. Uh, you know, the, the one thing is, is that, uh, you, the, you know, this very narrow window of, of treatment is, is important. I'm not going to say it, it isn't important and that sort of thing, but hopefully as we are able to, you know, as more and more people are going through uh, earlier diagnosis, they're getting the treatment they need, <clears throat> they come out the other end of cancer. I think the one thing that we didn't really, that nobody really touched on is that one, you know, 20% of newly diagnosed cancers now are cancers that ha are occurring in cancer survivors. So, you know, yeah, um, they survived the first cancer, but, you know, now they're teed up uh, because of biology, because of um, uh, their DNA to get another cancer. And yes, it, it, it's kind of, uh, how, do, how do we prevent that second cancer now from, from rearing its head? Um, how do we prevent, we, we know in, in breast cancer, more breast cancer patients die of heart disease than die of their cancer, right? Um, and so, yeah, so having the blinders on is, uh, we can't do it. This is a very complex, you know, this is a very complex issue, but then you say, well, what's the tipping point? Where do, where, where is the point in time? Um, and, you know, the, the results that I showed with regard to tumor proliferation rate is concerning. The tumor is still in the patient at that time. 
So maybe, you know, <clears throat> maybe we can kind of assume that after curative treatment and after response and that sort of thing, we can set people back on their feet <clears throat> and 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 deliver the message. OK, you know, go be well. Here's what you need to be well. Um, uh, though I think this teachable moment of cancer. You know, maybe maybe we just need to prime people to say, you know what? Diet and exercise are going to be an important part of your life. We're not really sure when, uh, when we're going to render, you know, to, to set you free on that. But we are going to tell you at some point in time that you got to get on the get on the stick and start, um, you know, start following the recommendations that are put forward. So. I didn't answer your question and maybe somebody else would be more eloquent in that regard, but it seems like at the very least at the at the uh, discharge visit is when we need to. When we need to um, render some guidance for these cancer survivors um, and give them some messaging beforehand. Thank you, um, Wendy. I see Betty. I see your hand up. Yeah. Uh, let me so, let me encourage people to put their hands up their their WebEx hand uh, if if they have questions. After Dr. Khan, we will go to Dr. Liamo on the panel, and then Dr. Pollock. And I then, mean, I uh, think Dr. Gold. I think the the elephant in the room for all of us is you know should we be encouraging any kind of weight loss you know during cancer treatment and. I think that's where the debate really comes in. Certainly those people who work with advanced cancer patients and people are losing weight would say no. Then there's a group of people who work with, you know, cancer patients who are going to have good survival and come into a diagnosis of obese or overweight. So I think that, you know, you can see that there's a lack of evidence there, but that really is the elephant in the room of, you know, a, a newly diagnosed cancer patient comes in should we is it safe and effective to um to recommend weight loss for that patient and i think we could i think you know most of the people on the panel would agree is we don't have the evidence there yet wendy That's showed right. some evidence that if you do it you know during neoadjuvant therapy it could be potentially harmful there are under there are studies undergoing now to look at how it impacts um survival but um it's still Vicki touched upon that. It is a question that um, with all the research we do, we still do not have the answer to that. So I think that that is really a uh, big research gap that needs further understanding. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Dr. Laiemo. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful conversation. Um, as a gastroenterologist, I noticed even in our practice, that more often than not, when patients present, you are likely to be looking at the patient right in front of you, and you're already making up your mind whether this person is obese, even without getting any, you know, measurement of any sort. That many a time we have to tell trainees, you know, if the patient present, still ask about weight loss, regardless of how, the, how big the person looks to you, that even obese people do lose weight. So the question then, for the panel, um, for those who, who are doing research in this arena, when really is the best time to actually assess obesity relative to cancer development and cancer outcome? So, because we know weight is a continuous variable, it keeps varying depending on what you are doing, what's going on in your life, what challenges you have, and stuff like that. So, when exactly will be the appropriate time to actually assess this relative to all the outcomes we are talking about? Um, is it going to be childhood? Is it when you turn, you know, when you be, when you turn 40, which is when they say life begins at 40? <laughs> is it when you are, I mean, at what time? And what interval before cancer diagnosis is your weight? And if we take it that your height is not going to keep increasing, right, for many adults, then the weight changes and, you know, treatment and everything else, when exactly is that measurement critical to assess the outcome we are thinking about? So I think uh, Dr. Wannafried uh, touched on that uh, in her just last uh, response, but Wendy, do you want to uh, um, repeat or elaborate on your thinking about when the advice should be given? Well, again, I think that, um, well, I one, to answer some of your questions, I think weight is important to it to assess and to track, you know, track that trajectory, you know, as many data points as we can get. 
that's the you know the optimum again i think that it, at the very minimum oncologists should be encouraged to say diet and exercise are important um we we may you know uh at the very least we we will be coming back to you at the end of your treatment to um to to give you some recommendations <clears throat> and i agree with Betty, I mean, we don't know during this period of time, we don't know if weight loss is going to be good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, it's, uh, we really do need data. So I don't know if that answers yeah. your question. Well, I think, I think you, you're, I think what I'm hearing at least is that the, the, the practitioner really doesn't have an opportunity to, to provide advice during somebody's adolescence or before they actually <laughs> present. So. The time, uh, the, the real question is whether it's prior at the time of diagnosis or after, after a treatment has been uh, applied. Um, and I, I think th you're saying after, <laughs> after treatment, after something. Well, something what, I'm, what I'm saying is, is I think it's important to teach, to hop on that teachable moment because cancer survivors are going to want to know some things that they can do. Right. Uh, and, you know, Nigel made a good point. You know, what's wrong with saying, okay, we can follow the recommendations that are put forth by the US dietary guidelines, the, you know, the ACS, we can't, we don't have any sort of assurances or, you know, any data that we can offer people. But, you know, uh, I think it's common sense that we could reinforce the dietary guidelines at that point in time, whether they're the WCRF, ACS, uh, US dietary guidelines. Okay, we have you. evidence. Good. And also the newer guidelines have tried to put a focus on maintaining muscle mass. That that's, you know, different from the older guidelines. You know, in trying to sidestep the unanswered questions, it's, you know, maintain a healthy diet, you know, um, and try to maintain muscle mass throughout this period. So thank you for that. Uh, so Dr. Pollack and then Dr. Gold. Yeah, I just wanted to make uh, a couple of comments and agree with some of the um, prior speakers, but I really think that for the purpose of the output of this uh, NIH session, we should put a big underline about the shocking lack of data for even the most basic uh, questions that our patients are asking us. And I put this on one of my slides yesterday. You know, as a medical oncologist, when a doc, when a patient asks me, well, I finished my chemo, what should I eat? Or if someone is, uh, has a family history of cancer and is not a cancer patient and they say, you know, maybe it's a scientist and they say, look, what do the data say? What should I do? Uh, it's, we're really not l n ready for knowledge implementation because even though we have teams of dietitians and well-funded centers in some cases, we don't know what we want and we have teachable moments. We don't know what to teach because we actually lack the uh, the fundamental understanding. It's not like it's obviously okay to teach people to stop smoking. There's nothing good about smoking. It's it's kind of easy, but when it comes to di to diet, we really um, have shocking. I would use that word areas of uh, uh, ignorance. I'll just give one example. Is in the risk arena, it's pretty clear that obesity increases the risk of certain cancers. But if an obese person loses weight, is that equivalent to never having been obese? No. I mean, we make that assumption without being 100% certain. Now, some of the data. There's some from... data, Michael. Sorry? I mean, there's some data, uh, Folsom. Uh, the Miyagi cohort. Um, well, so I would say the best, the actual best data, you know, uh, comes from the bypass surgery data, where obese people who have had bypass surgery and lose weight after uh, gastric bypass, not only do we have in that population weight loss, but we actually have real data about cancer incidence. So we're beginning to get those kinds of data for that question. But there's so many other questions where we're really at the um, 
at the uh, at the beginning of a of a journey of of understanding, and I think that therefore my two cents worth for the output of this conference would be a big push to address embarrassing gaps in knowledge, with a certain de-emphasis on knowledge translation, which makes the supposition that we actually know what's best broadly and we just have to communicate it. Uh, there are certain settings where that is true, but broadly there's more settings where we need to learn what's best for the patients or the at-risk uh, people who have not got a cancer diagnosis and then move uh, uh, from there. So I think it's it's important to recognize the 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 magnitude of the areas of unknown uh, facts. Thank you very much for that. Let me go back to our panelists, uh, Dr. Gold, and then Dr. Tr uh, Truesdale. Um, um, yes. Are the two I see, Dr. Gold? Yes. Hi. Thanks, Heather Gold. Um, as I'm listening here, I'm thinking with my methodologist cap on my head. Um, I, I took to heart um, Dr. Khan's point about the problem of cut points and dichotomous variables and thinking more about um, uh, percentile distributions or um, looking at the distribution and maybe clinically meaningful changes over time, this idea around trajectories in measure in measurement and how we measure, which um, uh, Dr. Daymark Wanafried mentioned, um, over time, and and Dr. Parsons looked at all the literature here, and one thing that strikes me is we say, yes, sarcopenia, no. Yes, muscle weakness, no. Um, yes, obese, no, or obese, overweight, normal, or underweight, but thinking a little bit about measurement and classifying perhaps with these, without these names and cut points, would some of that um, exploration of the data of how we define things perhaps help us in our understanding as we move this field forward? Good question. We got a raft of epidemiologists on this uh, panel. So uh, what, uh, what kind of responses do we have from the panel? Uh, not the panel, but the speakers, I'm sorry. I mean, I would say that, you know, even if you take a, a simple measure like BMI, the risk obviously is not, and we look at everybody over 30, the risk is very different for someone over 30 versus someone over 40, you know? So there are, you know, but to make it easy for screening and easy for risk stratification, we collapse data into these things, but they obscure true relationships of things. And, you know, as epidemiologists, we know that, but we have to make this easy for, clinicians to actually, you know, risk stratify their patients. And so I think a lot of the the nuances get lost. And I 100% I agree with you that um, we need to fine tune our message according to more to what the data says. Uh, yeah, just a quick follow up. Old, yeah, I was going to ask if that. Yeah, is, quick follow up on that yeah. is um, this almost seems like more of a a 4D or 5D question, right? It's a constellation of things across a continuum over time. Right. And and it gets tricky. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to just kind of put forth maybe a, a plea. You know, we, we found that this cathepsin L was a real um a real strong marker uh, of that was related to <clears throat> KI67. And we we found that we could you know influence it by diet, um, not well. You know, I, I'm I'm thinking maybe that's a harbinger of uh, bad bad news here. Uh, and I don't know if anybody has samples or uh, that could it could explore that because maybe that's a biomarker of um, of more progressive disease that might be responsive to dietary treatment. I'm putting that out there as perhaps a research question because I don't know the answer, but it sure would be a easy way to know, easy way to find out if people did have uh, um, access to samples and could do it. 
<clears throat> Thank you for that, Wendy. Um, we have one more question that I see from uh, our panel, Dr. Truesdale. Yes, I agree with everything that's been said, and I was just want to know: should we try to advocate um, other measures? You know, whether it's DEXA or other, you know, other measures besides just BMI, so you can really start to, you know, get at other things because. I mean, I study obesity and I understand how complicated it is and everything, but, and just looking on the whole, there's a different message that goes about prevention versus when somebody's in treatment and just going back around to these public health messages and besides it's being, you know, difficult for what the oncologist is going to say, it's really difficult for the patients to understand all these different nuances and conflicting measures messages. Yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think the, the speakers would agree that uh, more than BMI is needed for assessing um, the status of uh, patients uh, and their nutritional needs. Um, thank you for that. Um, I don't see any other hands up uh, from the panel. Those hands I still see up, I think, are uh, so-called old hands. So if <laughs> if if the uh, if the panel members want to want to raise another question, let me know. But otherwise, you know, remove your raised hand from the from the WebEx. Let me let me go to hey, Dr. Collins has her hands up, or Karen Collins has her hands up. Dr. Collins, please. <clears throat> Uh, to follow up on uh, how we can uh, advance, uh, identify the studies that can move this forward and answer these unanswered questions. What about the um, need for how we assess calorie intake or calorie needs um, instead of a, you know, actual measured um, calorie needs instead of estimates? Is that part of the problem in identifying in, in um, setting up these studies where people's caloric need may not be what we're estimating it to be or and visceral fat compared to uh, total fat, things like that. Here's anyone want to tackle that. <clears throat> Would you repeat the question again? What was Karen? Please repeat the question. Well, as we try to design, try to um, propose gaps that intervention studies could could answer these questions that are uh, at at hand about weight loss and so forth. What, how important is it to um, assess calorie needs in as part of designing those interventions? From my understanding, a lot of when we use an estimated calorie need, especially in people with cancer, it can be a huge variation, and so maybe part of the 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 error we're seeing or the the lack of clear answers is designing the intervention, or or is it that it's diet without physical activity, and and you know what what is it that we can identify as we're I, for this report um, highlighting where we think that the research needs to go? What what can we do to try and get a clearer answer? Mm -hmm. I mean, are you asking whether or not we should be using like methods of energy expenditure, perhaps to kind of tailor caloric restricted diets to people based on their, you know, more of a precision medicine approach? And I think, I think people are trying to do that, um, you know, like looking at protein requirements and things like that. Um, but I think the more the more puzzling question to me is why is there such a dearth of information of you know studying weight loss and in the clinical trial realm, right? There were two studies that she put up there, um, you know, during cancer treatment. And and you know, it goes back to kind of, you know, there's not a dearth of ideas, but it goes back to thinking about how these these uh, studies get reviewed in, in study section and they're probably, you know, I don't know. I'd like to hear the other panels, you know, like 
input on this or what, what we think is preventing us to have more data in this area. Do we think that people are just not going to fund studies where we put people on weight loss diets during treatment? Is, is that really what preventing it? Or is it something more than that? Because I don't think we can advance this field without understanding why we're not studying this. What, what is preventing more studies specifically in this area? And whether it be that you need to understand energy expenditure, you don't want to give a blank across the blanket, um, you know, dietary caloric restriction without understanding energy needs, that could be part of it. But I'm just curious, you know, um, What's preventing? Thank you, Dr. Khan. Yeah, that is really what I was trying to get at, I guess. Yes. Um, so we got the question the up there. I see Wendy's hand up. Wendy? I think it's more global than that, Betty, about why nutrition related work is not um, funded. I think, and, it, and it, I go back to my day, and I'm still an RD, so I'm, I'm never, you know, given up that title. Um, but I think there is a perception that nutrition is, you know, either voodoo science or it's non-serious, uh, and it's hard to get an audience if you're going into the, you know, you're getting reviewed in a clinical, you know, a, a very clinical study section. I, I don't think you get, um, I think you're dismissed as, you know, oh, that can't, that can't make a difference. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and the other thing too, that I, a point that was brought up is, I think some of the, the studies that we have, um, that we have a foundation of were very reductionist in nature and blew up in our face. So the ATBC trial, select trial, and so, you know, the NIH is saying, oh, my God, what a waste of money. We're not going to do this. And it was such a reductionist viewpoint that, that you know, we could take carotene out of a carrot and make it, make it you know, as active as a food component. Well, we couldn't. That was a fallacy. Uh, and I, I just think we've, we've suffered a black eye. Uh, because of that, and I also think there's a perception that, you know, again, nutrition, what, you know, what's nutrition? It's only the substrate that the, the cancer cell sees. It shouldn't be that hard to intuit that it is important, but I think there's a dismissal. Thank you very much. Um, so we have... Uh, <clears throat> oh, Bob, can I ask see. one quick question? This is Deb. Sure. Uh, so, sorry, so just, just following up on, I think, Betty, what you noted and, and kind of what's been talked around here. So, I still keep coming back to uh, how these, how these uh, studies are evaluated, back to study section, et cetera. Is, is what is, is one issue that is lacking um, absence of key outcomes or endpoint, endpoints or measures for each for, for these, um, you know, whether it's BMI or calories or uh, uh, the variety of endpoints we've talked about that are specific to each place on the continuum of cancer care that should be either identified, established, or other. So whether it's pre-surgical, during treatment, survivorship, et cetera. Is that one of the pieces that are missing, a, a, at least a well-accepted, identified, something that the study section can see? And I'm an economist, not an epidemiologist. I don't do power calculations, but, you know, an endpoint on a power calculation for a study under a view to study section. I guess I'm just getting lost about, you know, how do we identify moving forward? And I'll stop. I don't know if I made any sense. This is Vicki. I wonder if I might make make a comment. Um, just this is a very good question, and I wonder if we should be speaking about to whom we should address the concern that nobody is listening. And uh, uh, you know, I'm going to come to a cancer center in Canada, and you go to the front door, as I did 20 years ago, and said, "Excuse me, please, can you tell me where are the people in this building who are losing weight?" 
And I discovered that that information at that time was in paper records. Now that it's on an EMR, um, um, the institution has decided to train the EMR to, to calculate weight loss from prior body weights and every single time someone punches a weight into, into, into the equipment. And so they get a massive statistics that, that tell them who's losing what, what, what how all the body, the body weights are shifting. And they tie large magnitude weight loss to a prompt, simultaneous prompt to the dietitian, the um, medical oncologist and the clinic nurse to which they all are mandated to respond. And so, um, you know, if you'd come in the front door and said, where's the information? Someone would have told you at the time, you can't get it. If you'd address that request to the dietitian at the time, that was a, a, a group of person or a group of people working on a per consult basis with no possibility to change institutional practices. When institutional practices are consolidated and made, I think electronic in particular, um, you end up with what I, I did find 20 years ago when I wanted to, I, I, I had hoped to find out the body composition of every single patient in Alberta, Canada um, using their CT images. And they welcomed me in the door, sat me in the imaging department and gave me access to a PAC system that, where you can see every image of every person of every cancer at any time during their treatment trajectory. So it's 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 not just the frontline workers who might be mandated to be concerned and take an action about um, these issues. It's the institution and the manner in which the institution um, organizes the information that it controls. So if you have a storyline and you want to change things, you have to change it with everybody in the stack in order to 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 make a um, to make the progress that we are all hoping for. Thank you for that. Uh, let me <clears throat> point out that we just have a couple minutes left. Uh, I want to make sure that the panel has uh, had all their questions answered. Uh, Dr. Clayton, I haven't heard from you yet. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add. No, I just think this is fascinating and I appreciate, I appreciate the emphasis on the pathophysiologic pathways of cachexia and sarcopenia. This was fascinating to me, but I have no questions. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Tisha, I, 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 we have a lot of uh, questions from the audience, but I, I think we're out of time. Could you uh, clarify that for me? We do have a couple more. We have about uh, four more minutes remaining. If you want to take that time to entertain one question. Okay. Um, so uh, here, here's one maybe the Dr. Khan can answer. Uh, it's a sort of a two part question, but there was a, there was a question earlier on about the use of uh, high quality uh, bioelectrical impedance analysis uh, as opposed to CT and DEXA uh, based on a cost issue and based on a uh, making it easier for RDs to use as a clinical tool. Um, and then uh, attached to that is um, uh, Wendy's comment to you about whether, uh, what, 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 what does the poor correlation between the various measures of muscle mass mean and, and how best to approach these the, these variations in the measures that we use. So it's a measurement question uh, and, and I'll toss it to you. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask I'm gonna answer the latter and I'm gonna let Vicky answer the BIA question because she probably knows more about BI BIA than I do um, and more right. specifically about phase angles and how they may relate to muscle quality. Um, Anyway, um, so we were amazed to see that these correlations were so low, and these are raw correlations and the partial correlations when we adjust for uh, BMI and age are even much lower. And so what it means is that these measures are not picking up the same people. And when you use things like cut points, like I looked at DEXA cut points versus CT cut points, and in men, CT picked up more but they picked up all the people in DEXA, but they picked up more people. In women, it wasn't even the same people. They were picking up different people. When I use like an appendicular lean mass 
index versus a CT. So we cannot think of them as interchangeable. We cannot think of them that they, if we use one measure, we're going to get all the sarcopenic people that we would get with the other measure. And we need to have a better understanding of the differences, and especially in women. They correlate poorly in women, not as not as poorly in men. So I'm turning over to Vicki about the BIA, BIA and as a measure of both so I think uh, I think your your answer uh, indicates uh, several research questions, several gaps that need to be uh, answered. Yeah. Okay. So Vicky, do you want to say something about the BIA versus the other measures? About BIA, it is another one of a long list of imperfect methods. It it is is based on a completely different signal than any other methods. Um, it has clinical pragmatic utility. It has a very big measurement error. But you can use it, and I, I think there's an argument on one side to use those things that are accessible to you, and if they fall into the category of being accessible but not terribly precise, just be aware that you can use them to tell the difference between a person who's quite muscular and someone who's very sarcopenic, and 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 but deploy it um, because standing on the sidelines pretending that we don't need to drill down on body composition at this point is not an option. Good, great answer. Um, okay, I think that's it for this uh, this question and answer period. Back to you, Keisha. Thank you. What a great engaging discussion. Thanks everyone. Thanks Dr. Hyatt for uh, moderating that and thank you for all the speakers for your responses. Um, so before we break, um, I just want to thank all the speakers again and also Dr. Hyatt for serving as a great workshop and panel chair uh, over the past three days and for moderating this session. But before we break, I just wanted to highlight one point. So. We had a host of questions that were still left in, in the chat and we have been compiling those. And so I would encourage if you do any of the speakers, you have an opportunity to respond to some of those. Uh, and we could also probably direct some of them to you individually. Uh, if you can respond to some of those questions in the chat, that would be helpful since we didn't get a chance to respond, reply to all of those. So now we'll just take a 10 minute break and you can stand, stretch and have a cup of coffee, refresh yourself. Um, and then uh, please come back. We'll put a, a clock, we'll put the, time, the countdown clock up. And uh, when we come back after the break, we'll have an opportunity to um, have a closing panel. So go ahead and enjoy your 10 minute break. Thank you. Did you say something, Kimberly? Oh, sorry, I think she's talking. <laughs>
Welcome back and good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you had a chance to stretch your legs and refresh. So let's dive right back into the workshop agenda. We will now shift our focus to the contextual question, are nutritional interventions for preventing negative outcomes of cancer treatment cost effective? What evidence is needed to make the business case for providing nutritional services in outpatient cancer centers? So first we will hear from Dr. Helen Parsons on the uh, cost effectiveness results. Next, we will hear, we will welcome Dr. Patty Gans, who will moderate our closing speaker panel to discuss cost effectiveness and implementation of nutritional interventions and services. Welcome, Dr. Parsons. You may begin. Thank you, Keisha. Uh, all right, on behalf of the Minnesota Evidence Based Practice Center, I'd like to present the last aspect of our systematic review, which addressed a contextual question which uh, reviewed the cost effectiveness of nutrition interventions among individuals with cancer. The contextual question specifically asked what evidence is available on the cost effectiveness of nutritional interventions for preventing the negative outcomes associated with cancer treatment. For these studies that were eligible to be evaluated for information on cost or cost okay. effectiveness, we included uh, the databases uh, from Ovid Medline, Embase, and the Cochrane Register of Trials. Uh, and as a reminder, all of, uh, the in of the included studies that were eligible for our key questions one and two, these were um, included a, a review of broad search terms that en encompassed nutrition interventions related to cancer and were limited to adults uh, in English language. Uh, they only included randomized control trials that randomized at least 50 participants and were published from January 2000 to May of 2021. So for the key question that I'll be presenting today, we evaluated all of the studies that were included in key question one and four, and I'll uh, pre present a, an overview of those in just a moment, that reported any information on either the cost of the intervention or the cost effectiveness of the intervention, and recognizing that there was a, a wide variety in how this was reported and what was reported, we used definitions uh, of cost and cost effectiveness that were reported by the study authors. Our team also recognized that oftentimes the cost effectiveness of interventions is not necessarily reported in the primary results of the intervention and can often uh, be reported in other uh, data sources and uh, different uh, data source, data databases. And so we supplemented uh, our review of the key questions that were included in our in our primary uh, analyses to a gray literature search that looked at original studies and systematic reviews of cost effectiveness of nutrition interventions that still met uh, the same inclusion criteria uh, for the key questions one and four, as well as published studies from national nutrition and oncology groups. This slide is just a, a brief reminder of where we saw a concentration of literature and what types of nutrition interventions were being studied across the key questions uh, for eligibility and in, in review of cost and cost effectiveness. The majority of studies focused on nutrition interventions that were delivered after treatment began uh, and were focused again within uh, nutrition interventions that studied uh, the use of nutrition support, the use of dietary supplements, and the route or timing of nutrition interventions. So of the 184 studies that we uh, included in our key questions, only 5% of them, so eight total studies, included any information related to the cost of the intervention or the cost effectiveness of that intervention. Typically, as I will show in just a moment, this was provided as an overall cost relative to a comparison population. So in general, it was very challenging to identify the exact cost of the intervention or components of the intervention as it was delivered. Additionally, they were predominantly conducted uh, in inpatient settings in non-US health systems. So there's some question about how applicable those costs and components of, of the intervention might be uh, within a U.S. setting. 
So I'd like to go through each of the individual studies briefly so that you can get a better sense of the types of interventions that were studied and how cost information was uh, provided within the, the results of those interventions. So the first study uh, was uh, published by Braga and it was in an inpatient uh, population of individuals with cancer in Italy. And it looked at the use of total parenteral nutrition uh, versus early enteral nutrition. And they reported information about the cost per day of each of the interventions, finding uh, overall that uh, the use of total parenteral nutrition was significantly uh, more expensive uh, per day than early enteral nutrition. Uh, and then they also did, one of, it was one of the few studies that actually did break down the cost of the intervention by its components, uh, overall looking at the cost of the prescription uh, of, the, of the intervention uh, relative to other monitoring and personnel costs, recognizing that those two uh, were similar between the two groups, but they did not perform a formal cost effectiveness analysis. The second study was again in Italy by Giannotti, and they looked at the use of perioperative enteral nutrition versus a standard enteral, enteral diet, and they reported overall on the cost per group, uh, but did not do a significant breakdown by the, the different components of the intervention. They did report, and this was uh, amongst the key questions, the only uh, study that performed a formal cost effectiveness analysis. They reported that overall there was a net savings of about 2,000 euros in the intervention group per complication free patient. The next set of studies, um, one was in Poland, again in the inpatient setting, and they looked at the use of parental nutrition and omega-3 fatty acids. Um, versus parental nutrition and glutamine uh, in a second intervention group versus a standard parenteral nutrition. So they were really focused on dietary interventions, uh, dietary supplements. And so they reported overall on the mean cost of overall hospital stay uh, with the cost of the parenteral nutrition um, re uh, removed, but they did not uh, report on the significant differences between the cost of the two groups. Again, the costs were not broken down by intervention components for us to be able to identify the overall um, costs of the, the components. There was another study by Li uh, within an inpatient setting in China that looked at the use of enteral nutrition versus conventional perioperative treatments within a gastric, uh, individuals with gastric cancer who are undergoing surgery. Uh, and they reported on total hospital costs. So again, we're seeing a pattern here of really uh, varying ways of reporting costs, what was reported, what was reported the do denomination, um, and how they were calculating overall costs. Within uh, one of the, the only studies that was in Korea, again, in an inpatient setting, they looked at the use of total parenteral nutrition versus a nasogastric tube nutrition and found overall um, a higher cost in the uh, TPN group versus the nasogastric uh, tube nutrition group. Um, but they did do a breakdown, again, one of the few uh, by the different components where you could actually see what the added costs for personnel versus the, the intervention itself. And then finally, there was a intervention looking in China in the inpatient setting from a hospital to home nutrition management model versus a routine nutrition management, and they reported overall hospitalization costs. The last two studies uh, were of uh, were both again in China, uh, and they looked uh, the first in oral early oral feeding versus the delayed oral feeding. Uh, and presented overall hospital costs, uh, showing no difference between the two. And the final study looked at total parenteral nutrition versus enteral nutrition, um, showing an overall higher cost in total parenteral nutrition, but based on our review of the, uh, of the publication, it wasn't clear uh, of what components of the intervention were included in those overall cost calculations. When we went beyond our key questions, we've identified two additional studies. Both uh, were published in an, uh, within Italy, one in an inpatient and one in an outpatient setting. 
The first was from Braga, and they looked at the use of nutrition therapy with uh, intravenous supplementation uh, preoperatively versus um, uh, no supplementation. And I just wanted to note here they did uh, ha they did say that there was a perioperative supplementation was not evaluated because the preoperative approach was considered superior. But overall, they showed that the preoperative group had higher overall costs, but their main finding was that preoperative immunonutrition was cost effective within an within the inpatient setting. Excuse me. And then finally, a study, a very recent study by Martin looked at the use of nutrition uh, versus counseling only, uh, and they found that overall differences in quality of life were not statistically significant, but overall they reported that there was a 55% probability of the intervention being cost effective if using the threshold of uh, $30,000 uh, per quality adjusted life year. So where does that leave us? Uh, overall, as you can see, there were very few studies that provided information on the cost of the interventions within the primary study itself uh, that were either delivered or performed uh, uh, or, or that they delivered or performed a, a formal cost effective analyses in the context of these interventions. Overall studies frequently reported very sparse details about the added medical as well as the personnel costs that were necessary to implement a given intervention. And when they did, they were mostly summative. So presenting information on overall hospitalization costs, which did not leave us with sufficient detail about um, how we could identify which components contributed to the overall cost of the intervention. And finally, I'll just highlight that most of this cost information came from trials conducted outside of the United States. So the applicability and the, the cost of implementation uh, may be significantly different when uh, conducted within a US context. So before go going, uh, for going forward, I think that we've had many discussions throughout the uh, past three days. Uh, and recognizing that uh, while we do have a, a, a very limited cost effectiveness uh, evidence base that was uh, present within the literature, we need to be cognizant that before co cost effectiveness can be addressed, we really need to first establish the effectiveness of interventions. And I think that there's a number of opportunities and, and uh, ways forward that we've discussed throughout the, the past three days. So we do have an opportunity for future research that emphasizes not only the effectiveness of the interventions, but also the com components of cost and making sure that that information is detailed in a way uh, that is applicable to a US context. And finally, just ensuring that when our nutrition interventions going forward are conducted, that there's sufficient information and analyses on the costs of potential implementation of these interventions that can allow for uh, comprehensive and high quality cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness analyses to be conducted. If you have other questions about um, our search terms or the components of the studies, you can uh, please uh, feel free to review the full evidence report, which is now available for a four week comment period on the NIH website. And with that, I'd like to just thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Parsons, for sharing those results on cost effectiveness. So now we now turn it over to uh, Dr. Patty Gantz to moderate our closing panel session. Thank you very much, Keisha. Um, could someone advance, advance the slides? Yes, they're uh, they're up now. I'll advance for you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure uh, to moderate this panel. And uh, when I was invited as a medical oncologist uh, who's been thinking about uh, how we support patients uh, throughout my whole career, um, I was really perplexed because I really wasn't sure if there was an effectiveness database for which we should be doing cost. And um, I'm, you know, confirmed, I guess, in what we just heard from the evidence based center about this, but I don't think this should necessarily discourage us. I think what we've seen and what I've seen in my career is cancer care has shifted from the inpatient area 
to the outpatient area. And when I started uh, in my first academic appointment at a VA hospital in the late 1970s, I ran an intermediate care ward, which was for cancer patients with advanced disease, largely colon, lung, prostate, many of whom were getting radiation, very little chemotherapy. And if they were lucky, they had curative surgical treatment. And at that time, we were just a few years after the institution of the National Cancer Act in 1971. And as part of that, there were many rehabilitation demonstration projects funded throughout the country. And these were all inpatient and they did a wonderful job assessing patients, not only for the physical disabilities associated with cancer, but also nutrition. But as we've all heard and we know, cancer care has advanced to the point where it's almost all ambulatory treatment uh, with limited inpatient stays. There's no coverage at this point in time for nutritional services in the outpatient area. And the stress on the system is really because of this. Nevertheless, we need to find ways to um, demonstrate the value and the efficacy of interventions that can support patients at all phases of the cancer trajectory. And of course, this particular meeting has focused on patients at high risk early in the course of diagnosis and treatment. But as others have said, this is really a big issue for survivors as well. So there's a very complex, long trajectory. Patients don't finish their treatment sometimes until nine months or a year afterwards. And so the treatment period is actually very long. And it was interesting to me that there were very few studies that even looked at this issue of the long treatment period. And that's, I think, a big issue in terms of the sarcopenia and myosteatosis that we have seen uh, demonstrated. So I'm very lucky to be hosting an expert panel. If we could get to the next slide, I'll just briefly introduce them. So uh, Dr. Renee Taylor, um, who is at the University of Maryland Medical Center, where she's Vice President and Associate Chief uh, Nursing Officer and leads the ambulatory care services, but she has a long history uh, of involvement with parenteral and enteral nutrition and is a leader in this area. Um, Dr. Gabriel Brooks, who is a medical oncologist at uh, the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, is a gastrointestinal medical oncologist, and he's been involved with the oncology care model, which was a demonstration project from the CMS Innovation Center, and he's going to be able to share information about that with us. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Hoke, who is a health economist and a chief of the Division of um, Health Policy and Management at the University of Cal California at Davis, will be providing his perspective. And Dr. Uh, Sarah Downer, who is an attorney at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Innovation Center, um, but was previously involved for, uh, with the Center for Personal, Personal Care person-centered care at Harvard Law School, looking at health law policy and innovation, especially related to nutrition. So welcome to our panel. And if we could go ahead with the next slide. Dr. Tyler. Thank you, Dr. Gans, for that introduction. Uh, next slide, please. So from, uh, from my perspective, uh, how can we define the value of nutrition uh, you know, to be cost efficient, cost effective, and high quality? We really have done a nice job in this, this um, all the presentations that we've heard have certainly advocated for clinical resources, appropriate coding, and payer reimbursement, and that is important to funding vital nutrition care. We also really need to make sure we're having those conversations around ensuring the medical community can prove the value of nutrition care in terms of outcomes over cost and, and looking at that additional evidence to support that. We really need to harness the value of nutrition, uh, we as the healthcare professionals, but also those payers and policymakers by measuring the cost and effectiveness of nutrition interventions on things like quality of life, infectious and non-infectious complications, length of stay, mortality, and readmissions, of which um, I'm in, in my world, in my real job, um, uh, very much centered on um, reducing utiliz unnecessary utilization. Next slide. So um, from an Aspen perspective, the, As the American Society for Parental and Enteral Nutrition, we realized that the literature showed a lack of malnutrition-related outcome studies that specifically evaluated those direct hospital costs 
and outpatient costs, as well as indirect costs, including loss of patient productivity and downstream complications, so a little, ease, a little harder to measure those. So Aspen explored nutrition research within some key domains, and we modeled those outcomes using the Medicare 5% sample claims database. And we modeled studies using oral nutrition, enteral and parental nutrition. And we found that there, we, if we modeled those with the studies that we utilize, we could support significant Medicare program savings in reducing those hospital stays, mortality. And this is a big number, but just you know, at first glance, we looked at a, an estimated $500 million in savings, which got a lot of attention when we extrapolated nutrition support in high therapeutic uh, conditions. Next slide. So what were the recommendations from our work? Well, we, we truly believe that re researchers need to include the cost benefit element to their outcome variables to ensure that attention is given to the monetary investments and potential savings of using timely nutrition interventions and appropriate ones uh, in modifying risk. Funding RCTs that include cost data will assist in proving to payers and healthcare leaders that treating and preventing malnutrition is beneficial. And then ensuring that we're using national guidelines that facilitate timely evidence-based nutrition. And lastly, investing in clinical economists. And that was a role I had never really worked with before, but incredibly valuable in giving insight to assist in rigorous study design and data analysis. We believe that would encourage incorporating cost as a concrete variable in future studies. Next slide. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Brooks. Thank you very much. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I, I um, as Dr. Gans uh, introduced, I, I have had some uh, involvement as a, an evaluator of the oncology care model, which is the CMS um, alternative payment model. And that's, I'm gonna take that perspective for some of these points. Um, and I think you'll hear a lot of similarity between what uh, Dr. Tyler just shared. Um, so existing payment models, as we know, do not really adequately incentivize nutritional care and cancer treatment. And how can I, how can we say that? I, I you know I think it is true that as we saw in the evidence summary that um, the evidence is not as good as as we wish it were. Um, and yet at the same time, we heard from the patient, uh, the two patients at the top of the session on how important nutritional interventions were to them. Um, and to the, to the extent of the second patient who would not be alive uh, today, as, as someone pointed out, without the, the TPN that he was able to access. But both of the patients also described how difficult it was for them to access the nutritional care that they placed a high value on. So I think a lot of clinicians like myself, I take care of these patients in my clinic, recognize that there, there seems to be value here, and yet the evidence doesn't support that. So we're all eager to help generate that evidence so that we can bring these services to our patients. Um, so in the current environment, though, we don't have necessarily the resources to provide, not every center has the resources to provide these, um, these interventions. Alternative payment models seek to improve the quality and value of cancer care, and the oncology care model um, just completed its, its run um, from 2016 to 2022 as um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, first large cancer-focused alternative payment model, and really the largest cancer-focused alternative payment model ever. Um, and then uh, the date here on the, on the second bullet is, is incorrect, um, but the, the CMS is coming out with their enhancing oncology model, which um, has been described and will start in 2023 is my understanding. Um, and so these types of alternative payment models could serve as a vehicle to incentivize nutritional care um, and, and could help us show us what kind of outcomes we need to need to be focusing on in some of the studies. Uh, next slide, please. So here are the quality measures that were used in the oncology care measure. And these quality measures are important because the way that the OCM worked is that practices were trying to reduce costs of care over episodes of care. And then uh, they could get some of this, um, some of the, these savings, they could win those as performance-based payments, but only if they also met quality benchmarks. So the practices were only eligible to, to to sort of win in, in the pro, um, and, and get some of those performance-based payments if they also demonstrated high quality of care. And the, the quality measures included the proportion of patients with ED visits without hospitalization, the proportion of patients admitted to hospice for three or more days before death, assessment of pain intensity, pain, planning for pain treatment, screening for depression, and patient-reported experience of care. 
Um, so from, from this, I th thought that the first and the last were the ones that were probably most likely to be impacted by nutritional care. Um, you know, to the extent that, we, that it can be demonstrated, and, I, and this is very similar to what uh, Dr. Tyler showed in, the, in her, on her slides, is that if we can show that uh, nutritional interventions do reduce um, utilization of, of emergency department care, um, then this becomes uh, something that that is feeds into a winning strategy for participating in, in in an alternative payment model. And likewise, um, we know that we saw two patients in this session who who talked about how important um, nutrition was and dietary support was for their experience of care. If we can demonstrate that high quality nutritional care um, contributes to patient experience, um, then there's another uh, another quality measure um, that. That, that can be augmented by implementing uh, nutritional care. Next slide, please. So the key questions um, that I, I hope that um, interventional studies can address it, uh, include, do nutritional interventions enhance quality of life? Do they improve survival? Do they prevent unplanned hospitalizations and ED visits? And do they reduce costs to payers over an episode of care? Um, and if they do any of these things, um, then they may may be, um, you know, then then a, a framework of an alternative payment model may help to incentivize and support these nutritional interventions. Um, and that's uh, we can go to the next slide and the next speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Hotch. Hotch rhymes with Scotch. I'm a health economist. And I study value in healthcare using cost effectiveness analysis. I agree with what the previous speakers have said, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate. I wanted to think of something wise and smart to say, so I, I looked through the literature to find a famous philosopher. Next slide. And I think this sums up my perspective. If, if we really do believe that there's value here and the challenge is just to sort of find the evidence, then I think it's imperative for us to go ahead and do the studies that will show the value. Uh, we don't want to leave it in the arena of we're going to try and we're going to try to find value. We're going to need to do the studies and to do the studies. It's possible we'll need funding to support the doing of those studies. So to think about the next step after they're done next slide. We may want to be going beyond just doing the studies. We may actually want this to be used. So I would urge when we consider a plan investing in more studies of the cost effectiveness of nutritional interventions to be thinking about who is the target audience. This is not necessarily a cost effectiveness analysis is not a study for patients. They may want a decision aid. It's not a study for clinical folks. They may want a clinical guidance document. A cost effectiveness analysis is a piece of information that is very relevant and interesting to healthcare payers, someone taking care of making funding decisions for a population. So if we really think our target audience for the cost effectiveness analysis is decision makers, then we might want to target our research to be of maximum use so that it will be used by those decision makers who are the target audience for this kind of research. Next slide. With that sort of in mind, um, I'd like to share with you my perspective about how we can get the most use out of the cost effectiveness analysis if it is something we wish to support with research funding. The first thing to think about is who are those decision makers? Um, those decision makers are actually the ones who are going to be informed by recommendations, recommendations made by the United States Preventative Task Force, the USPSTF, or recommendations made by the Institute for Clinical and Economic Research, that's ICER. So those payers, let's say Medicare or some large private insurance company that's going to be influenced by those recommendations, it would help if those recommendations were something along the lines of, this is good value for money. Right now, um, Dr. Parsons and her team has shown us what the literature looks like for the cost effectiveness. We see studies that are not from the US and they're inpatient, but at least most of them are old. So clearly we're going to need to make the evidence base that we want to see, which will then become an ingredient in 
evidence review by the USPSTF or evidence review by ICER. And um, in some cases, they will do their own systematic review like Dr. Parsons' team. In other cases, not only will they look at the clinical evidence, they will also look at the economic evidence by building their own model, but they can only make a good model if they have good ingredients. And right now, we may be lacking on those good ingredients. Um, a couple other things to think about would be, how do we want to, or rather, when do we want to do the research? Do we want to be studying the cost effectiveness before it's funded? And or do we want to be studying the cost effectiveness after nutritional interventions are um, actually funded? For example, maybe there might be a, a pilot project and potentially we could see in the real world how do things work. There may also be strategic opportunities to um, team with others who may be thinking about cancer treatments and it's possible that nutrition would make those cancer treatments appear even more cost effective. But it seems to me most cause cancer treatments have, mm, shall we say, mm, rather high extra cost per extra effect. So it, it seems like nutrition and studying nutrition would be something that would be very attractive compared to say some of the other things that are currently funded by um, cancer funders. And last but not least, I would do the funding of the cost effectiveness analysis in two phases. Phase one would be a simple, quick and easy phase where if you decide you're going to fund studies of showing whether the uh, interventions are more effective or not, ask for and specifically fund a part where you also look at the extra cost. So with one data set, you can make an estimate of the extra effect of this. And with that same data set, you can look at the extra cost as well. This was what Dr. Parsons showed us in that final study. She shared the one that was the most recent. So this person level cost effectiveness can be done with simple methods like net benefit regression. It is not too controversial because you're just analyzing the data that you have collected. It's right there. And you're hoping to use that data to influence clinical practice. So why not also look at the extra cost as well? The second phase after the first phase has been funded and done would be to introduce models. So this would be going beyond the time horizon of the initial trial and going beyond potentially some of the data that were collected. And this happens when people become dissatisfied with the first phase and they say, there may be other areas of value that we can't show with the trial. So then you go, okay, this is why we're gonna fund phase two of the modeling. Phase two would be modeling to say, let's draw together the evidence base to see what evidence we have about extra value that we're missing because we're not either looking long enough or not looking at certain outcomes. Last but not least, I would try to make the models that you fund accessible so that people might be able to type in different numbers or different beliefs so that they can see how attractive this looks for them. Next slide. This is my final slide and the recommendations that I would suggest to the panel. I really believe it would be important to identify the decision makers. I believe cost effectiveness analysis is done to influence not the patients, not the clinicians and not the cancer center, but is done to influence the funders. And it's possible that the funders are actually influenced by people who are groups that review evidence. So it won't be your or our research. It'll be a group that uses our research to then make a funding recommendation that will then be followed by a decision by one of these decision makers. So we got to figure out who they are. My suggestion would be USPSTF and potentially as well ICER as people we'd like to feed fine evidence to. We just need to make that fine evidence. It needs to be healthy. It needs to be free range. It needs to be organic evidence. Well, well done. Um, it's also possible that after there's reimbursement, there may also be a need for additional implementation science research projects. For example, now that it's reimbursed, how do we actually get centers to do this? It may be that they might need different types of economic analysis like budget impact analysis or knowing the cost components. So to summarize, I would try to figure out who our target audience is. My belief is it's people who make recommendations or the funders. Then I would try to get them the information, the evidence that they need. And we can do that by funding the research that is currently lacking. And that would be, in my opinion, the cost effectiveness. After the cost effectiveness has been studied, then we might consider advocacy. So I think that's the, it for me. Next slide.
Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Downer. I'm with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. I don't have any conflicts to disclose. Um, coming to you from CMMI, uh, which is how I'll abbreviate the center, uh, which was established by the Affordable Care Act in 2012 within more the broader CMS, um, Center for Medicaid, Medicare Services, um, with the purpose of testing innovative payment and service delivery models in our public insurance programs um, while we preserve or enhance the quality of care. So we ask to either be budget neutral or cost saving and either maintain or improve quality of care to be successful in our model tests. Um, but I'm gonna take a step back and, and be broader than my CMMI vantage point right now and look at what's happening in the healthcare system currently, and then how we can start to really bring nutrition interventions um, and services to people along the entire cancer continuum. And over the, the last three days of this workshop, folks have spoke incredibly powerfully to the need for reimbursement for dietitians um, and other nutrition services so that patients can really get access um, and improve their, their outcomes and improve their quality of life, the experience for families and caregivers, just so much really powerful information and first-person accounts that have spoken to that. So I'm here to talk about how that happens in the context of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and there are two categories of support within our public insurance programs for healthcare services, two pathways, right? I'm a policy lawyer by training, so I think about, you know, how do we make this actually happen? through our, our legal and regulatory pathways. <clears throat> so the first way that things are paid for by Medicare or Medicaid is that there is explicit specific coverage for a specific service. So a dietitian visit is paid for within, within Medicare. And the second is what Dr. Brooks referred to, right? There is this capitated or bundle payment or population-based payment, right? which basically means there's a, there's a bucket of money um, that's for a certain range of services and that there may be within the parameters of what those dollars are allowed to be spent on enough flexibility that the healthcare provider or health plan can pay for nutrition services for cancer mm -hmm. patients. Um, so that's what Dr. Bush just spoke to in, in the CMMI oncology model. So there, so those, just to summarize those two pathways, like number one, specific coverage, specific services. Number two, there's a, a bucket of money generally with some rules on how that money is spent. Nutrition, we hope, is one of the services that, that can fit within those rules. And when it comes to nutrition services and integrating those along the cancer continuum, there are pros and cons to both of those types of support. But what's really important to think about growing this body of research with an eye towards both of those pathways to coverage. Um, they inform each other in a lot of ways, in a lot of really important ways. So, and I think it's really important to note that from my vantage point, where healthcare is going, I think over the long term is likely towards more and more of that second type of payment population-based payments where the payer or provider has some level of flexibility in how to spend the dollars that they're getting um, with some accountability for patient outcomes. I think that's where we're going, but we certainly haven't left our fee-for-service specific payment for specific service um, context behind quite yet. Um, generally, you know, what I've heard over the past couple of days from most of the presenters is that when we're talking about reimbursement, we're talking about that first type of support. We want very specific things to be paid for, um, and that's the fee-for-service construct. We want a certain number of visits with a dietitian. We want medically tailored meals or some other kind of nutrition intervention. So let's talk about the pros and cons of that type of coverage for a moment. So the pro, right, if there's explicit coverage of a specific service within Medicare or Medicaid, and the person is eligible for that service, then there's predictable financial support for it. So if we had dietitian services that were specifically covered um, for someone with a cancer diagnosis, that means if you're a Medicare beneficiary, no matter where you live in the country, no matter where you're getting services from, you are eligible to have that dietitian visit, right, if you qualify. So in theory, there's uniformity across care settings. And fee-for-service coverage can drive access to particular providers. So if we say dietitians can bill for this service, then if a cancer center wants to bill for that service, it has to have dietitians on staff in order to do that. Um, and finally, you know, this is the really important part, point. What's covered in, in our fee-for-service programs 
um, informed capitation rates and amounts for those population-based payments. So if we're giving folks, you know, a big chunk of money and we're saying, pay for the care for your patients, um, we want that money to be sufficient to cover all the services that we think are important. And so if nutrition services need to be included there, we want the, the amounts to be sufficient. And so fee-for-service coverage as the baseline for how those um, amounts are set can really help ensure that the amounts of those payments are sufficient to pay for um, nutrition services. But there are big cons to, to that coverage. And the biggest one, not to the coverage, but to driving towards that coverage, um, the biggest one is that it's a huge lift, right? So, for example, with respect to Medicaid, Medicare, rather, you're going to need either to change the law or you're going to need a really strong body of research that shows the impact of specific services. And then what you're covering, if you get specific coverage, is just that. It's, it's a discrete service. And so by the time you get there and you climb the mountain and you have the coverage, you might know more and you might you want to change it or add to it or enhance it in some way, and it's just really hard to do based on new information, right? And so research towards specific coverage means a lot of research. It means that demonstrating all the elements that we think are really important. It needs to do that, and it needs to have a very rigorous design. Then there's the, the second type of way that things are getting covered and paid for by Medicare and Medicaid dollars. Dr. Brooks mentioned this. Um, it's the, the bucket of money, some regulations on how it's spent, but lots of flexibility to cover nutrition services. And so that's where healthcare is going. CMMI has committed to having its models and activities drive everyone towards sort of having being in these accountable care um, and potentially population-based payment relationships. Um, for nutrition services and cancer, there's a couple of really significant pros here, especially given the state of the, the literature review as we've seen it, right? The providers who are working with these types of payments have significant flexibility to integrate things into care that they think will work and they can respond to new information quickly, right? It, it, they can do it as quickly as they can figure out how it works with their business model. Um, so, so that's really good. And they can do what's best for patients. If that means hiring dietitians, they can do that. If they want to hire community health workers to help folks navigate their food insecurity, they can do that. Um, but there are times, and this is the hard part, because this is where healthcare is going, and so we need to, to have both of these kinds of research that's driving toward both kinds of coverage in order for these to inform each other in a good way. Um, there's no guarantee of uniformity in what's covered. So we heard this really strongly um, in our opening presentation today. We had Tim who had access to nutrition services at his cancer center. We had JJ who did not initially have any access to, to nutrition services, um, and they really both needed them. So that's the, sort of what you get with this much discretionary um, decision making on the part of cancer centers and, and providers and payers, right? If they can make the choice about what to cover um, in this huge range of services, and we know in the cancer context there are lots of unmet needs. It's not all just nutrition, but you know, there's an array of things that, that cancer patients um, and others really need to, to make their healthcare effective and to get the best results out of it. Um, and then if there's no guarantee of coverage, that means that nutrition services just continually need to prove their value um, across lots of different fronts. And that lack of specific coverage can leave nutrition services vulnerable to really being de-emphasized. Um, and then from a CMMI perspective, it's hard for us to know exactly what's happening. We know there's tons of stuff happening at, um, in, in care across the, the country when it comes to cancer. But if there's not specific claims that sort of are visible to us on our end, it's hard for us to know exactly how much of that is being delivered and what kind and to whom. Um, all the things that frustrate researchers uh, about this also frustrate uh, the policy attorneys at, at CMS. Um, and, you know, when we're providing some of these population-based payments and we're trying to set these rates, a lot of those rates and the things that we're going to, to pay providers in those bundled payments are based on historical expenditures on core services. And so it becomes very difficult, I think, for providers and plans to make the determination that they're going to be able to provide a lot of new services 
um, in those current budgets because it, it's based on what they already sort of were billing um, for, for, for specific services that they were providing. So this is where the cost-focused um, research and the cost and the cost effectiveness analysis that we've been talking about today is really going to make a difference. And I want to underscore a ton that um, Dr. Hatch's comment that research, especially for this kind of coverage, needs to be geared towards the decision maker. Um, it's got to show, you know, relatively short-term and predictable impact on costs. So that can be on a lot of different fronts, right? It could be about hospitalization. It could be about the ability to complete treatment. You know, there are a lot of ways to think about cost effectiveness um, in this context because there are things that are important to these decision makers, the folks who are going to decide how this money is actually spent. So it could be, you know, clinical efficacy, but it could be a lot about quality of life um, and the experience of the patient who's going through cancer treatment and their family and, and really sort of giving those folks the best experience that they could have because that is good for, for a cancer center or for a particular provider. So, um, you know, thinking about the decision maker is really important. So I'm gonna leave it there and we can expand more during, during the discussion. Thank you. We're going to go into some discussion questions and I think our speakers have really highlighted a number of the areas that we're gonna be discussing. Um, so I think there may be a slide on the first discussion question, but I can just read it. Um, so this is to our expert panel, and then obviously we're going to extend to the uh, panel reviewing the whole meeting. How do we develop the evidence needed to demonstrate the cost effectiveness and overall effectiveness of nutritional interventions for cancer patients receiving care in outpatient settings? And I just would say that from my point of view, it's a tremendous challenge as a medical oncologist when I think about patients um, with advanced disease who have very different needs um, in terms of uh, the weight loss that they may have had, the cachexia, the difficulties in eating that they may have. It's very different than a screen detected cancer, uh, be it uh, breast, prostate, colon, where the patient has very early stage disease, is likely going to approach curative or multimodal therapy, but is in good shape and doesn't have advanced disease. So where do we target this? And again, where should we go in terms of trying to get this initial evidence? Because we could, you know, again, there are over 100 different kinds of cancers, different types of treatments. I wonder if our panel has any ideas or thoughts about what's the low hanging fruit here for getting this cost, cost and evidence-based data for nutritional interventions. Gabe? I can give some probably fairly obvious thoughts, but I, I am a clinician um, and, and um, you know, thinking about starting with the easiest pop the populations where people think it's going to be easiest to demonstrate the benefit. Um, and, and I think that there probably are, there won't be consensus on that, but, but um, in my view, it might include patients who, um, who have a, you know, who are most likely, you know, who have what, what everybody would agree on is a, is a nutritional pro or a dietary nutritional problem that, that is likely to respond to an intervention. And, and, um, and so making that study group um, homogeneous enough and making the outcome um, sort of uh, fitting the outcome well to, to, to decision to, to an outcome that decision makers are going to, are going to deem to be relevant. So I guess that that might be a starting point to answering this question is defining the patient population carefully and defining the outcome carefully. Great. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Hutch. Um, thank you. So um, if we treated it like it were uh, a drug, it would be tricky for us to think there's just one drug that's going to work for all cancers and all people. And so let's assume that we know which diet, we know which patients, we know which cancer, that kind of thing. Then to be super efficient about which research design, uh, just to re reiterate what I had said before, I really think doing a trial-based cost-effectiveness analysis where we're not going to let perfect be the enemy of good. We're just going to say, you know, you guys do as best job you can finding out if there is really any extra benefit. Just how does this help people? And we're just going to pay a little attention to how much we're spending because maybe people who have to pay for it in the future might be interested in that too. And although we know it's not going to be perfect, we're going to say, hey, look, this is the extra we're gaining in terms of patient outcome, and this is the extra we're gaining from uh, the extra it's going to cost. And we're just doing this based on the trial that was funded. 
it, it has an aim three that says do person level cost effectiveness. And of course, it's not going to be perfect. And of course, then the next phase could be the modeling, but it, it wouldn't be super hard. If you could put together a trial, it really wouldn't be difficult to add on a component where we say, we're going to look at the extra cost based on the data. We're going to look at the extra effect based on the data. And this is what we're currently seeing. And I would suspect that there are already some nutritional interventions underway where this could be potentially looked at, even if they, they have an idea of what the costs are for doing the intervention and, and so forth. So, again, people who are out there now collecting data in randomized trials could be adding this to what they're going to do. And again, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, but let's get a, a handle on what's the magnitude of the cost. And then we have the magnitude of the benefit with an endpoint that's meaningful clinically. And if I could just add, it's not only a wild, crazy idea from me, but it's also what you can see in Dr. Parsons review. That last study she talked about, the most recent one, has an example of where they just analyzed the data they had. That's the one where they said it was 55% chance of being cost effective. But I don't think that's that percentage is based on the fact it came from the trial. It's based on the fact that there was a lot of uncertainty. And that's where we could redesign the next trial to be a little bit more focused. Maybe there's a group for whom it was especially effective or a group for whom it was especially not effective. Um, but it, it's, this is not fantasy. This can be done and, and has been done. And uh, Dr. Parsons gave us an example. Dr. Tyler, did you want to say anything about this? Well, you know, I'm, I'm probably um, too concentric circles removed from NIH. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a, a clinical researcher, so I want to quantify um, my and qualify my statements. I, I'm approaching this from the nutrition support clinician that I was for 20 some years. And it, it's really daunting when you, you want to be part of a. You are frozen. Might be having a bandwidth issue there. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we hope that she'll come back. Um, you can jump in while she is mm -hmm. off, if you don't mind, Dr. Gantz. Um, so I think one thing that we can do is, I think Dr. Hatch said, we take existing studies and you can add on a little component onto it. There are also things that CMMI is doing, so the enhanced oncology model that Dr. Brooks mentioned um, will be evaluated, but it will be evaluated in a very particular way for the things that CMMI is looking for. There are opportunities for other researchers to come in and think about evaluating other components of what people are doing and what sort of the model participants are doing within those models around nutritional, you know, interventions. Um, that might be also really helpful. And I think someone in the chat also mentioned Medicare Advantage plans. And what are they doing? What are they covering? You know, that's a great, that's another great opportunity for research where we can really think about, you know, is there something that's already happening? And can we look at it a little bit more closely and figure out what we can glean from, from that already? Yes, uh, phase, early phase trials, if you will to look at the costs and then move them into larger demonstrations. That would be good. So I think we'll go on to the next question, which is uh, what has been learned uh, by the demonstration projects to date, uh, such as the CMS oncology care model. Can we move this slide ahead? Uh, or other initiatives about the cost effectiveness and overall effectiveness of nutrition services in the outpatient cancer care service and how can this be applied beyond study settings? I just wanted to say, um, I, I talked to one of my colleagues who had been in practice. I was interviewing her as part of a, another research study. And um, I asked her, you know, how the oncology care model might be helping in her practice. And she said, well, you know, I'm not sure it's helping us so much because we already had two social workers, somebody doing palliative and hospice care. So we were looking pretty good before then. And so I said, really? Well, how could you afford to have those social workers and other people in your practice? And she said, if a patient misses their therapy, if they don't have transportation, if they don't have something to eat, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they're not going to get their chemotherapy. And of course, 
you know, oncologists are reimbursed by how much drug they give, but so there's a benefit there. But the point is they were holistically caring for their patients because the need to get patients and address their social determinants of health, which I think is really the, um, the, the elephant in the room in some ways. Uh, it, yes, it's the disease, it's the cachexia caused by the tumor, but many patients are under financial duress getting their cancer treatment and then nutrition, even eating high quality food, as we heard discussed, may be very difficult. Even if you gave a prescription for high quality food, somebody may not be able to afford it. So, um, uh, anyone you want to speak, either Dr. Um, Brooks or uh, Dr. Uh, Tyler, anyone else about these demonstration projects and again, uh, how we could look at the cost effectiveness. I very much like the idea of the hard endpoints that CMS is using. And again, I think uh, either avoiding ED visits or avoiding ED visits that go to hospitalization, those are the big cost drivers. And again, those would be really strong outcomes. I can, I can speak a little bit on this. I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, I don't think that, that we've learned too much directly about um, about nutrition services um, that that I know. I mean, I think there's been a lot of learning um, on the ground level learning. I don't know that there's been a lot of programmatic level learning because it hasn't been yet. And and please, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Danner, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there's been a lot of programmatic level learning on this this specific question. But I do think that you know what there has been is greater um, understanding that okay if 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 we need to try to prevent, prevent hospitalizations and ED visits, which are central, you know, we're central to the quality measures for the, for the model. Um, then we need to understand what puts people at risk for these hospitalization ED visits and, and right to the top of that list of things that puts people at risk is, you know, poor nutrition and, and, um, and de, um, you know, poor, uh, poor performance status and everything that contributes to that. Um, so I, I think that uh, there hasn't, you know, there hasn't been, um, a lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge generated specifically because it wasn't built in um, as a as an objective at the start. Um, but there has been a lot of on the ground learning that can translate to that can translate to experimentation. I just wanted to quickly say that you know the decision. One of the interesting things about this category of payments as um, that, that are not you know not um, payments for a specific service, but the decision maker here is the practice. The practices get to decide how are we going to pay, how are we going to spend. The money that the revenue streams that we get from participating in these models, um, and so the decision maker, um, the person who, who who's deciding based on the cost effectiveness models, is not necessarily the, the CMS program administrator necessarily. It's the it's the practice manager and and the team that that are directing the response um, to the model who get to decide. Do we want to do we want to hire social workers? Do we want to hire uh, uh, dietitians? Thank you. Uh, there's been some uh, conversation in the chat about this that uh, dietitians were a, a key component in many of the OCM uh, practices. So again, identified by the practice as a need for their patients, depending on who you're serving. So I think that's very important. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to go on to the next question. Could we have the next slide? Um, so how can the needed evidence be applied in terms of guideline development, payment policy, and integration of healthcare systems to increase the availability and use of nutrition services in outpatient cancer care settings? And Dr. Tyler, you're in a leadership position. Uh, what do you need in your health system in order to bring these things to bear? Well, first of all, I apologize. During my earlier comments, I have no idea how much everyone Heard, I noticed my picture dropped out and then my whole internet went dead. So I'm back on with my phone hotspot. Hopefully that will last for a few more minutes. Um, so, you know, certainly in, in our Aspen value work, we did talk about and integrated into our project around how you have these conversations in the C-suite. How do you have this conversation with your care transformation organizations with the, your payers? And, and to um, Dr. Brooks's conversations around alternative payment methodologies, we, you know, we're in Maryland, and so we are the last waiver state for, for uh, CMS. And it's been a, an exciting ride to be a part of some novel approaches within our, our service lines, et cetera. So we've, we've been able to drive down PQI, CHF, diabetes, those kinds of things by figuring out where we're going to spend our dollars. And it is on a pharmacist in our in our diuresis clinic for CHF. 
So we need to take those, those um, value added programmatic decisions and implement them in cancer care the same way. So I, I really agree that that's that the, the people who are nearest to the patient know what they need. Um, so I, I, I think that is definitely the way to go. And then, you know, in our transitions of care, I think we fail people quite a bit. And um, I know in my days as a case manager and discharge planner, we would discharge patients on certain types of ventral nutrition. And then down the road, when they started their chemo, they would need to change that. And we weren't really talking together to make sure that we knew what was working today was necessarily going to actually work two, four, six, nine weeks from now, which was not cost effective because they had two cases of, a, of an intro product that they weren't going to use anymore. So educating our peers and really looking at transitions of care and not just thinking about episodes of care. And then lastly, I'll talk about, you know, the problem with on the provider side, it's fee for service. And on the hospital side, it is more around that value added. So um, uh, CMS again is really uh, dialing that up to say uh, the, the physicians, the providers need to be at the table as well to know that we need to be value added, not just, um, you know, dropping CPT codes so that they can get more, more billing. So I'll, I'll stop there. Ms. Downer, do you wanna say something uh, about that or? I mean, I think I would just say that when we go to look at some areas where we can innovate at CMMI, you know, we look at some of the, the low hanging fruit, like um, avoidable hospitalizations, ED visits, and we always start there. And I think there are some things that can be demonstrated, maybe across cancer types would be the hope um, with respect to nutritional uh, interventions, with respect to those things. Those are big ticket items for us. And we are statutorily, we, by law, we must consider costs, right? And we, and we must look at cost reduction or cost neutrality. So these are, these are places we definitely start, um, although it's not all that we, we look at. And I, I guess I would just say too that um, there are a lot of competing priorities for um, extra dollars, flexible dollars. Uh, and so we want to be sensitive too to the fact that I think there are places where we're going to start to see inroads for nutrition care. But if it's at a place where there are just a low um, number of cancer case cases uh, at a particular, in a particular care setting, in a rural setting, um, we may not see that same investment. And so we have an eye um, and are thinking about equity and access across different geographies as well. And that, that's just something that, that underscores and is in the background of, of everything that we do. We're not totally sure how to solve it, but some of the flexible dollars going to, you know, the places that it's needed most could mean that the, the sort of person who um, is not in the biggest population with the with the most demand uh, doesn't get the services that they always could use or, or benefit from. So something to keep in mind as well. And that's where some of the telemedicine services could be available if they were found to be effective, you know, again, effective interventions, because I'm thinking of Australia, which has, again, a big rural population and, and has used telemedicine for many, many services for a long time. It's just, again, new for us because of uh, the pandemic. Um, but we need those effective interventions to be able to deliver them that way. So, um, are there any more, any, anybody else wanna add something to this question before I open it up to the uh, panel for the meeting to have their questions answered? Okay, well, why don't we go ahead? Uh, I think, is there, I, is there another slide or is this just, let's go to the panel. Dr. Hyatt, do you want to have your team come on and let us know what their questions are? See, I have to see if I can see hands. Um, one second. Does somebody have a question for us? Uh, this is Deborah Ritzwaller. I have a question for Dr. Hotz. So you mentioned uh, the parameters that you believe are the, the most informative for cost effectiveness analysis to inform stakeholders. 
uh, especially those involved, whether it's CMMI or um, CMS, uh, et cetera. So maybe this is also to Sarah Downer. We heard uh, yesterday, or the I forget the day before, that it's also key that uh, NCCN has has buy-in or has strong recommendations about this. So I just wonder, um, it, you know, is there priorities around those three entities? Um, and does the type of analysis, um, the type of CEA analysis differ by per perspective or does it differ by perspective depending on the stakeholder? So, especially NCCN versus CMI, are the are the CM are, are the big simulation models um, key to uh, informing these kinds of these kinds of decisions, or um, are there different strategies within a you know a, a lar within a intervention study? Um, you, you, somebody mentioned, and that's why I, I always mention that an aim three that hopefully won't get cut with the budget cuts, an aim three to address the cost effectiveness. So I'm just really interested is our does the perspective does the method does the the incremental cost per per change in what differ by um stakeholder so any uh, uh, maybe this is both to Sarah and and others Sarah did you want to answer that first Yeah um I mean what I can say from the CM, CMS and CMMI perspective is that it depends on the pathway that you're going to use to try to establish coverage. So, um, you know, if you're going to try to establish coverage via one of our ways that we do this in Medicare, if it's not by statute, is by a national coverage determination. And so our staff takes a look and they do a deep dive through the literature and, and they really sort of sit with it for, for a long period of time to come out with whether this is something that's really going to be useful in the Medicare population. But another way that things are added to Medicare coverage is by is by statutory change, right? By changing the law. So your your stakeholder is Congress um, there and with a lot of, of course, caveats to what that means, right? If it's your advocacy groups and it's everybody. Um, but there's a storytelling component to that kind of um, to, to that stakeholder group that is different from the folks that in in our coverage and analysis group within CMS who are just going to look at the the literature and really sit with it. Um, so, so I don't know if that helps, but I'll, I'll stop there and, and let Dr. Hatch. Jump. Thank you. Uh, that's very helpful. Um, I have a few thoughts on the matter. Um, from my perspective. The an important strategy is to look for a way to get this funded because once it's funded, I think many of the obstacles will start to melt away. Um, so I'm coming from that perspective and you had mentioned also about perspective and I think depending on which decision maker we're targeting, we will need a different perspective. I am certain that the healthcare payer will care about their payer perspective. They'll, they'll care about their costs. Um, it's possible that other groups may have a broader perspective looking at potentially informal caregiving costs, potentially other costs that don't accrue to, say, the payer. So, um, for example, ICE or the Institute for Clinical and Economic Research, they use not only a healthcare payer perspective, but they also use a societal perspective. So, initially, early on, I think a very simple, small, incomplete trial might um, Part where we have cost effectiveness might be a good way to get things started and then we can grow larger. But I believe that whether it's USPSTF or it's ICER, they will do their own analysis. Our work, I think, is to start to break the ground and start to create the ingredients they will need. And if we can get a recommendation from the United States Preventative Services Task Force saying that this is a good thing, then I believe, and Sarah backed me up, that Medicare will be required, uh, not Medicare, healthcare payers will be required to cover it. So it's possible that the work to do this is impossible and that's not our optimal strategy. But if it is possible to create high quality evidence that the USPSTF says, look, we think this is good quality evidence and they're not even looking at costs, 
showing that it works, then there'll be a statute saying this has to be covered. And I suspect um, it would make sense to start simple and that might be looking at a smaller perspective and then growing to a bigger perspective. Does that answer your question, um, Dr. Ritzwaller? I think so. It, it, it's getting there. Use did a doc, line. Did Dr. Gold have a question? I, I think yes, I saw. Hi. Um, really, this is my favorite stuff. So thank you for, <laughs> for bringing it to us today. Um, uh, Dr. Hotch, your comment about a person level cost effectiveness analysis was really interesting. And I'm thinking about how much evidence is missing. And what about. Um, starting with a mini model instead of a mini analysis off a of trial. So we create a mini model where maybe we're grabbing EHR data from multiple um, cancer centers of a variety of flavor. We're thinking about, oops, and we're thinking about um, healthcare utilization patterns that we see when nutrition services aren't available. And then we do some what if and threshold analyses in a mini model to say, well, this is how good nutrition services would have to be to be cost effective. We'd save one hospitalization here and an ED visit there or whatever it is. Like, how are we um, um, improving um, healthcare use as a cost to look at those cost trade offs for paying for nutrition services versus um, upfront and, and rather than. Uh, terrible care stream that we could have avoided or un we call it unplanned admissions, right? Um, anyway, I've been thinking uh, really hard about that. And thought maybe some of you would have some comments and and other data too. I'm I'm the one who's like on the Medicare Advantage thing. I'm wondering what else is going on out there that we can't see. Thanks. Well, I was reflecting on Dr. Barakas's comments about the electronic health record and really how all this data should be available for somebody to look. And, you know, this is really the idea of a learning health system, but it would be looking at a weight trajectory and or, you know, um, potential, you know, people getting intervention versus not in an observational way to see if there was anything uh, going on, particularly in places that might have services available. So I, I think there should certainly be data mining available from electronic health system records right now that that would make this feasible. Other Dr. Gantz, is it all right for me to respond to Dr. Gold's sure. comment? Sure. I think Dr. Gold, that's a fantastic idea to use a, a simple model, especially like if we were just looking at break even analysis or just something to say, how bad would nutrition have to be in terms of cost or outcome before it just doesn't make sense. And then to say, it's not even, theoretically possible that it could be that bad. It, it, it's just, especially compared to what we're currently funding for cancer, even if it only works half as well as we think it does, it's still gonna represent good value for money. So I, I like it for that. I worry um, sometimes that full contact health technology assessment sometimes involves working with people who don't believe our assumptions. Um, and that's why I was thinking we push a little bit with the data so we can say, look, the stuff you are going to use for the clinical belief, that stuff in the trial, if we use that, this is what we're actually seeing. But I, I really think you've got a great idea to employ the models to, to create some what ifs and to show that there's just very little chance that this is low value. I think that's a smart way to go and then a smart way to grow and say, if we saw it with a simple model, what more could we see if we put a little more time and attention into this? Dr. Brooks. And to that point, I think, you know, I think um, I saw some comments in the chat from a couple different cancer centers talking about the expansion of, of um, dietary care under OCM or under other. Uh, and and these, a lot of these cancer centers have, have started to do that. have started to, um, to do their own analyses, their own, you know, what, what's our break even point with, with this and those cancer centers have voted with their feet. They're hiring more dietitians. Uh, so uh, hopefully those, some of those analyses will get published. Um, I do think that that's one of the nice things about these alternative payment models is they do create kind of a, a natural laboratory um, where you can do, you know, pre post analysis, you know, even if you don't have a, an analytic a, a conventional um, experimental design, you, you can do something. Maybe you implement your care 1st, to 1 site and later to another site or, 
or you can um, do a pre-post analysis of some sort. And you can, you can get start to get some of the data that I think um, uh, Jeff is talking about uh, to, that starts to justify some of these assumptions. There was also there was also a comment in the oh, chat ahead. here about uh, cancer being a disease of the elderly and and being the target population for Medicare. And again, in so many other situations, we don't use study drugs in older people, but this is where we should be focusing, I think, on the Medicare population because of all of the issues that we've seen with potential pre-existing frailty and, and the difficulties in receiving treatment and so forth. And so, uh, again, Medicare, if they had this demonstrated to them in terms of efficacy uh, in an intervention in a target population, it would make a big difference because once Medicare approves something uh, and moves ahead, the other payers usually follow. So. Is there somebody somebody else has their screen open? Is there another another question? Yeah, this is Renee. Tom, can I just add about the data is, is what's important in the earlier comments about data is big data. So partnering with some of the large health systems that really are looking at big data um, in machine learning. Um, we certainly are at University of Maryland and, and harnessing some of that as well as enhancing the EMR so that the local teams can get this data in real time because there's such a lag with so much of the payer data and it doesn't have a lot of good clinical uh, data in it. So I, I do think data is a big piece of this that needs to, to really be looked at very closely. Dr. Clayton, I, I see you have your hand up. Yes, this conversation makes so much sense to me. And we've talked a lot about what type of data would be beneficial. And I was struck by Dr. Hotch's comments about target your audience. Does the panel have any thoughts about where these data should come from? What comes to my mind is how would we incentivize our comprehensive cancer, cancer centers to say that nutrition support and counseling is every bit as important as distress evaluation and support? I'd be interested in anybody's thoughts. I think there had been a suggestion earlier in the meeting to do a supplement to this a CCSG to have this kind of thing be brought to the fore at the comprehensive cancer centers to really stimulate this. And again, that would be low hanging fruit in terms of funding that the NCI could do in terms of getting uh, getting this out into you know, 50 different cancer centers where this could be, in fact, evaluated either with existing data or, you know, if they have had interventions going on uh, to show use of this. So, again, that would be a very easy thing, an easy recommendation and to, to look at cost and cost effectiveness. Yep. Um, this is De Deborah Zweller again. So, uh, following up on Patty, both your comment, Dr. Tyler's, and I think we brought up Medicare Advantage. I think estimates are that. Uh, approaching 50% of Medicare eligible patients will be in, in a, or individuals will be in a Medicare Advantage plan within the next decade. And talking about big data sets and opportunities for data mining, I'm wondering if my uh, distant colleague Betty is still on the is still on the uh, the the uh, conference. If Easter. she's looked at it there, I, I know until I was involved with this panel, I didn't realize it wasn't a covered benefit under CMS because it has been provided with, within Kaiser Permanente systems for quite some time. Um, but as I think Gabe noted, it, it is a, a balancing act on priorities, uh, the dietitian versus a social worker, et cetera. But I'm wondering if, if there aren't some opportunities to do that retrospective data mining on use versus not users versus non-users. And also thinking about, I, I think um, I've heard that the Medicare Advantage data sets will be released from RASDAQ or others sometime soon. So I'm assuming those would be standardized codable values that might be available even in those data sets coming up. So I'm so getting the message. Of the panel, that may have been a question towards Betty Khan. Uh, well, I, I got the message from Keisha that we need to wrap this up. So, um, <laughs> but I think that'll be good for the lightning round probably to, to cover on on that. So, thank you to my panel and thank you for the great questions. So, I think, uh, we need to turn it over to Keisha and whoever is next. Yes, thank you. What a fascinating panel and discussion. Um, thank you, Dr. Gantz, for moderating and for the speakers uh, to the speakers for sharing your insights. 
And now we want to have a we will uh, have a wrap up session and lightning round moderated by Drs. Joanne Elena and Ashley Vargas. The wrap up session will be followed by closing remarks. In the lightning round, each presenter will have one minute to share final impressions and recommendations to the attendees and the panel. We will not be using slides. The recap will go in presentation order. At this time, we ask all of our presenters to turn on their cameras, but remain on mute until your name is called. Dr. Zelena and Vargas, you may begin. Okay, well, Ashley is on vacation, so I think I will be handling this. We will um, let her remain on vacation today. I will announce three um, speakers in a row because there's so many speakers. And Keisha, I don't know what I did to you to try to make me do 30 speakers in 30 minutes here. So please, speakers, please keep your um, please keep your uh, your comments very succinct. First, we will start with our leader for the workshop, Elaine Trujillo, followed by Mary Playtech and uh, uh, Helen Parsons. Elaine. Yes, thanks, Joanne. I'm going to go fast. I have two action items, actually. So I think many of us were not surprised about the lack of evidence we saw in the report. Um, I see that as an opportunity, as I'm sure many of you do, um, and it tells us where we can start. Um, certainly, it seemed to me that methodology and standardizing it is a great place to start. So I'm not sure how best to do that, but in the government, when we don't know something, we form a committee. So that's what I'm suggesting that we do. All of you who are interested, please reach out. You know where to find me and, and let's start on that. The second action item is regarding NCCN guidelines. Um, we don't have evidence yet, clearly, for nutrition interventions um, yet, but I do feel like the low hanging fruit is nutritional assessment, nutrition, non-nutrition screening. So the NCCN uh, actual guideline developments on their website say, quote unquote, in some clinical situations, no meaningful clinical data exists and patient care must be based upon clinical experience alone. And so with that, I would make a call out to all of you and especially those physicians, because that's where that's where we're driving these to um, let's let's move, let's get together work on these NCCN guidelines, let's move the needle, because I think the theme of this has been, it takes a village, and so it's gonna take a village to move those NCCN guidelines. Thanks. Mary? Yes, um, so uh, quickly, uh, Helen um, and her group did a great job at describing how vague and how sparse the literature is. So here's what I'm gonna say. Um, we will never have the data needed if we can't uniformly ID the problem. So whether it be malnutrition, sarcopenia, cachexia, we have to have uniformity. We need to come to terms with operational definitions that we use consistently. Secondly, I still want to bring up risk versus status. It is not the same. In, there, in a lot of medical settings, we realize how important it is to establish risk so that we can prevent problems down the road. And so I would like to uh, note that, and also uh, risk will help us with cutoffs and all of these kinds of things. So I just also want to say that risk, versus, risk identification versus status is important. And I just read about uh, 50 more papers today, reviewed them quickly in our setting here that use both risk, that they assessed nutritional status using a risk tool. So I'm gonna stop there. I have lots more to say, but I'm staying, I'm staying within time limits. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Um, so I think we saw over the course of our presentations that we have a lot of really heterogeneous nutrition interventions, broad range, but they're mostly in head and neck and gastrointestinal cancers outside of the U.S. So that points towards this need to get more evidence in a U.S.-based setting 
but also to collect things that are important um, and valid, using validated tools that are the most important to clinicians for their decision making, as well as individuals with cancer and their caregivers, as well as collecting information on the cost so that we can have an eye towards the dissemination and implementation, as well as the reimbursement and providing information and tools to payers in order to feel like they have the evidence necessary to make those reimbursement decisions. Great. Um, we'll have Mark Klein, Kunal Katakaya, and Marcus Goncalves. Mark? And I realize not all of these speakers are on the line with us today. So, um, and if you're on the line, I'll come back to you. So, Kunal? Marcus? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. So yeah, um, you know, three points uh, that that I think need to um, be addressed. So we need to establish minimal standards for what nutritional screening should look like in the U.S. So these issues can be identified by care providers, uh, particularly the patients, particularly the physicians that are seeing these patients in, in real world, similar to what we have as current mandates on distress and, and pain screening. Uh, we absolutely need to increase funding um, related to clarifying cut points for body composition. So the rather extensive body of research that's published is more sort of consistent with one another. And uh, there's been a number of researchers out here who are, you know, who are improving that science, but there's much more to be done. And then you know there's a number of basic scientists here. We we certainly need more funding that is directed at the root cause of these issues. And, and I think we've learned from the basic scientists that have presented here that there's a lot more, there's a lot that we do not know in regards to the basic science of nutrition and how it interacts with oncological outcomes. Great. Um, Marcus. I largely agree with what everyone has said, and I'll just add one more point, which is I think the more focused we can be in population probably the better the chance of seeing a successful outcome in the trials. And recruiting these kind of large heterogeneous groups is to our deficit. And if you can show that an intervention is effective in, let's say, a head and neck population, you know, I think that's a great starting place to get these interventions approved. Colleen, uh, please. Great. It was, this was fantastic. Um, I will say there is plenty we don't know, but we do know very much some certain things you know, with certainty and with evidence that the majority of patients with cancer are malnourished. And at some point along this continuum, and this is linked to higher rates of toxicity and treatment and all the things we've heard about and greater morbidity and mortality that uh, patients want nutritional support. And although dietitians are trained and available, it's this lack of reimbursement that is really preventing them becoming integrated wholly into the healthcare team and the oncology team. We do have evidence-based diet and physical activity guidelines, and they should be encouraged at any time point in which patients are receptive. And if dietitians were part of the healthcare team, they are uniquely trained to identify these teachable moments and to empower patients to adopt and sustain healthier behaviors across the continuum. Um, most funded trials focus on therapeutic nutrition, like the fasting and keto and all that, or reductionist approaches. And we need both funders and reviewers to be more receptive to unique and innovative nutrition trials that look at whole dietary patterns and lifestyle behaviors because people eat food. They don't necessarily just eat one component. but we need all of them across, we need all these trials. And then, um, you know, I definitely agree with Elaine that action items would be to continue these conversations. This was fantastic. And to convene a targeted work group, perhaps with people from each one of these different panels so that um, we could really keep working on this. And I, I, I'm gonna close with saying, you know, if you had, for instance, somebody with breast cancer and lymphedema and you didn't have a physical therapist who they could see, that would be considered near malpractice. So we have to be thinking about nutrition 
in the same light as some of these other therapies um, that they are necessary and needed. So thank you. Um, Syed uh, Kavni. Uh, Carlo Prado. Hi, uh, I would like to highlight again the importance of randomized controlled trials that are patient oriented and pragmatic, which really allows some flexibility to achieve nutrition targets using different approaches and really learning what patients can tolerate and what's realistic. Uh, pragmatic trials, they are usually embedded in clinical practice or conducted in conditions that are going to mirror uh, what's being done in clinical practice. And this can potentially enable faster implementation of ev evidence based nutrition care. So I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jill Hamilton Reeves, and then we'll be followed by Cindy Thompson, Michael Pollack, Roan Levin, and Liz Isering. I would like to expand on what Dr. Prado said about randomized controlled trials um, and even the, the preclinical work that it would be great if we could have a study section that um, was tailored to this topic for interventions. Um, and then since I've, I've gone down the cooperative group path, I also think thinking about study section composition to have uh, people on study sections um, that understand cooperative groups for some of the larger phase three trials to help close that gap. Thanks. Great, thanks. Cindy? So, in addition to really supporting what Colleen said in the role of the dietitian in, in advancing some of this work, I really want to emphasize the variability in the rates of malnutrition, even prior to cancer, among um, racial and ethnically diverse individuals, low income individuals, people with limited access to food, older adults, and rural residents. And just make sure that as we move forward, there's a priority given to addressing these vulnerable populations. And then lastly, I just want to reinforce the earlier discussion around really trying to develop an illustration of the conceptual model that we're dealing with here to really show the complexity of what's happening and begin to more systematically address each area um, with the appropriate stakeholders involved. Thank you. Michael Pollack. Rowan. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. The, uh, my summary points would be that we must address the unanswered questions regarding physiology and pathophysiology of nutrition in relationship to cancer before we can plan to optimize nutritional aspects of cancer care. Um, we have to make it explicit to stakeholders how little we know about nutrition and cancer. Most people assume, most patients assume that their doctors know exactly what they should be eating. And they get angry because the doctors sometimes fail to discuss it. The reason the doctors often ignore this topic is because they don't know. So once we're more honest and explicit about the gap in knowledge, We've taken the first steps towards justifying more research uh, in this area. And then I think we could move to a situation where there could be targeted requests for applications and targeted workshops so that we could address these uh, gaps in knowledge. So we have a big research challenge and the first step is to acknowledge uh, rather than pasting over the important unanswered questions. And my last sentence is, this all is likely going to be catalyzed by the very recent evidence of specific interactions between certain treatments and certain diets. And I illustrated some of those in my talk. And that's the kind of specific evidence that could provide a jump off point for asking more general questions. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to um, re-emphasize the um, 
the working on the patients that have the highest risk for malnutrition. And, and as we were talking today, for example, there's a broad scope of patients who are receiving treatment. Many patients may benefit by weight management during treatment, after treatment, um, and so on. But just focusing on those patients that we know to be the highest risk for malnutrition, including the head and neck and the pancreatic and the GI cancers, which is clearly where we also have a lot of, uh, a lot of research is ongoing. Um, and we do have some information uh, at this point that shows benefit of nutrition during the uh, during the, that particular type of patient experience. Um, but I wanted to just kind of reemphasize the idea then that that I think there's a an opportunity in the setting of what helps patients to get their treatment. And since we have data already that shows that people who are malnourished do not get as much treatment, um, anyway, I just think that that's a, an opportunity. Um, I also just wanted to close with, I don't know, we didn't really spend a lot of time talking about malnutrition screening. Um, and in fact, if we were to um, have the data that demonstrates that patients who are um, being screened with malnutrition, um, that we're finding them earlier, I think if this was implemented across the, the board, all cancer patients, if this was a guideline, all cancer patients received malnutrition screening throughout their treatment. Um, I think you would start to see the scope of the problem. And so now you would have documentation, you would have data of how many patients are triggering with a validated screening tool, how many patients are triggering. And I've actually seen this happen at facilities that I've worked at where we've implemented these screens where, you know, 40% of patients are triggering for malnutrition. And the question is, what do you do with them? And I think this is kind of forcing the point in terms of um, administration of cancer centers and things. What do you do with them? And I've actually been asked that question by a surgeon of can we not train somebody to do this besides the dietitian? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> so, anyway, I think it, it would be valuable um, and beneficial for patients. Thank you. Okay, and our up all night panelist, <laughs> Liz uh, uh, Isering. Is there Thank you very much and uh, congratulations on tackling a very important, but as we can see, extremely complex topic. So my suggestion is to start with where there is data. So we've got international data that um, integrated nutrition care, particularly in those high risk groups like head and neck cancer, uh, is cost effective in the international setting. So great if we can get some more US based data around that. Um, you know, we've had lots of talk about what outcomes to use in cost effectiveness and of course everyone Every, when I say everyone, clinicians and health economists, heck yeah, it is late. <laughs> Those people that do the cost funding, um, you know, love survival. And of course that's important, but when you talk to patients and, and um, you know, their carers, there's a lot of emphasis on, um, you know, pain management, symptom management, quality of life, where we also have good evidence, uh, particularly around quality of life, that nutrition interventions do make a difference. So my recommendation is to Look at where the evidence is, you know, form a nice uh, uh, committee and looking at specific models of care in those high risk groups, particularly where we have existing data and uh, do some of those simple cost effectiveness uh, measures, but including important measures like consistent screening, assessment, body composition, all those things that we know are important, but also the outcomes that are important to not only clinicians, but patients and their caregivers such as particularly around quality of life. We'll have Betty Kahn, Vic, Vicki Bericos, um, Wendy DeMarc Ronafried, Helena Furberg, uh, Betty. Okay, we'll skip to Vicki. Betty may step stepped away for a second. I'd like to say that I am really struck by the fact that uh, I think the first thing we need to do collectively is to get our house in order. So if you don't have a set of diagnostic criteria uh, for cancer associated malnutrition um, that are uniform and that everyone can apply um, to their populations, their clinical trial, you know, their clinical study data sets, um, we're, we're promulgating a diagnosis of cancer associated malnutrition, which is different depending on which tool and which expert and which authority um, you choose. And that's just rubbish. Um, so I think being able to um, come up with a very strong credentialed and consensus based and valid set of diagnostic criteria 
is 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 going to be hugely important. It's ringing in my ears. Um, one of the speakers saying that there is so actually several of the speakers, those who did the new, the um, systematic reviews, saying that in no domain of this area can data be aggregated, no domain. And that is a very damning statement. And, and the reason is that there is not a common set of anything. And that's in our house. If we want to go to other people's houses and knock on the door and say, um, screen to cancer centers, if you want to engage with clinical trials groups or cooperatives, other organizations, we have to have our ducks in a row to be able to extend outward. So I, I, I'm a proponent of some very nuclear effort to make what cancer associated malnutrition is absolutely clear to everyone. Great. Wendy. I know we're late in the day. We may be um, okay. Uh, Helena, I'm moody. I, I I can talk. Okay, great. Okay, Come sorry. On. Took yeah. me a while Come to on. unmute. Sorry. Um, so uh, after Vicky's comment, and I and I know that we come through to this uh, topic from much different uh, perspectives, and I think that this this workshop has been instrumental because it's taken us all the way from cachexia to obesity. Uh, and I think we need to, it, this may be just too big of a topic for us to, you know, we might need to have subgroups in different areas in order for us to, to make progress because the, the malnutrition that occurs with many GI cancers, head and neck cancers is so much different than the overnutrition that we encounter with prostate cancer. Um, and breast cancer and those types of cancers. Uh, it's uh, and so I'm I'm struck by the, you know, th that we're trying to, uh, you know, that of how aud audacious it might be to get a, a bunch of oncologists uh, to agree on a treatment uh, of of cancer when. Some oncologists treat those cancers and some oncologists treat the other cancers. And we know that, you know, some, some therapies work di differently in other, you know, in, in different cancers. So uh, this is a very broad topic. I enjoyed being part of this. I think I, I, I know I learned a lot on it, uh, but there's, a ve there's very much of a heterogeneity in what we're studying, what the interventions are, and then also what the outcomes are. You know, we capriciously say quality of life. Well, are you talking about physical functioning and, and that sort of thing? Are you talking about mental functioning? We really have to nail this down. Uh, so I do agree that we do need to nail it down, but it's a very huge topic. Thank you. Helena. Sure, from the molecular epi standpoint, um, I would say that we need more molecular investigations or basic science to help us understand cancer related wasting. I strongly agree with Marcus, who just mentioned that we don't lump different cancers together in our studies because there are likely lots of different mechanisms, different treatments um, going on. I think we also need to expand our studies to consider the entire trajectory of cancer, including pre diagnosis during treatment, and then even long-term survival, because optimal body size probably differs um, at these time points. Great. Um, we will, okay, so I'll have Renee, Tyler, um, Gabriel Brooks, Jeffrey Hatch, and Sarah Downer. Renee? Gabriel. Um, well, I'll just briefly say that um, I'll advocate for using both measuring both costs and out and other and effectiveness. And in terms of measuring effectiveness, so uh, defining the study population, defining the intervention, lo looking for areas where 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 uh, research is most likely to be impactful, um, where the intervention is most likely to be impactful, but then. Um, 
focusing the measures of effectiveness on things that are of, of importance to payers and to patients and to decision makers generally. And I think those include the some of the quality measures that, you know, there's a pretty limited um, portfolio of quality measures that that are broadly agreed on. Um, but those include the things that, we, that we've been talking about, um, including hospitalizations and ED visits and including uh, um, quality of life and, and patient experience. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, cost effectiveness includes both the cost and the effectiveness. I think other speakers have mentioned that cost isn't uh, survival isn't the only element of, of effectiveness, although it can be one element of effectiveness. Um, but if we align those elements of effectiveness with with the quality measures, then we're most likely to be speaking the right language. Great, um, Jeffrey Hatch. Thank you. I'll put the long play version in the chat of what I wanted to say. But in the interest in being brief, I'll say that. I'd like the committee to remember that we ought to consider beginning with the end in mind when we study value using cost effectiveness analysis. We want to understand who we are trying to influence with this cost effectiveness analysis, why we're trying to influence them and what matters to them. Again, more detail in the chat. Great. Um, I skipped Betty Khan. Betty, can I put you on the spot and come back to you? Now? Sure. What was the question? A bullet point. I think the one thing I agree with what everybody has said, but I think that also we have to, as I was listening to these talks, there's there's the screening for malnutrition when you come into a cancer diagnosis. And then there's the whole host of things that have to do with how can things like nutrition and exercise enhance treatments, chemotherapeutic treatments or immunotherapeutic treatments like we talked about with calorie restriction. So to me, there are two different avenues in research. It's it's what does the host look like going into a diagnosis and what, what can we do to, me, to optimize that? But then what specifically nutrition and, and exercise interventions, how can they enhance the immune system during treatment to maybe actually interact with the chemotherapy or immunotherapy to, to have better outcomes? Great, thank you. Um, Sarah Downer and then Chris Lynch and um, Marcel. Sarah? All right, so I want to um, highlight what Dr. Brooks said about quality measures and what Dr. Hatch said about decision makers, because those are both extremely important points. And if the decision maker is CMMI or CMS, then um, quality measures are certainly where it's at. Um, in addition to, to some of the other things that we talked about. And I want to reissue my invitation to come on over and evaluate things that CMS and CMMI are doing with a nutrition focus, because that is something that, you know, external researchers can do and will be really, really helpful because having the data, even if it's not sort of a rigorous RCT, but having data that comes from CMI, CMMI and CMS's own activities is going to be really, really influential. So, um, reissuing that invitation to the researchers on this call. That's great. And I got five more minutes from Keisha, so we're be, we'll be able to include everyone. Um, next, Chris Lynch. I uh, well, I was just wondering, as uh, you know, NIH plans for research in this area. What, what do people think would be a great moonshot study or? You know, what, what is the low hanging fruit or research that we, that you'd like to see us, you know, you know, sort of support to address some of the problems uh, highlighted in this workshop. You have 1 minute, Chris, so we can put those comments into the chat, right? Or maybe mm -hmm. people can, um, where, where would be a good place to put that information? Is there a, do we have a chat board somewhere? Just send them to me, all your ideas. Great. Sorry, Chris, I'm going to be tough. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, anything else in your last 10 seconds? No, no. Okay. That's what thank I want to know. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Thank you. Okay, Marcel and then Linda Nebeling. Hi, I'm from the National Institute on Aging, and we are co-sponsors. So I wanted to say that you know the the Aging Institute reflects on older older adults and their heterogeneous 
and they have a lot of multiple chronic conditions. And so I think that's a key point to bear in mind in these studies. Um, we have a high interest in sarcopenia and we've worked on standardizing the definition of that in recent years. So I think, um, you know, that's a, an example. Another example I wanted to highlight was from Grant Williams talk yesterday given by um, his colleague, but evidence on geriatric assessment um, was presented and provides an example on how this multimodal intervention included in nutrition and can have a positive health impact. So I think that's an example of a trial that did show some results. Two trials were presented and both recent. Um, and, and it is tailored to address the heterogeneity, and it doesn't just address nutrition, it addresses the multiple chronic conditions and the cancer. Um, finally, I think, you know, we've highlighted a lot of tri about trials, but I wanted just to say um, that I think that there's a room for high quality observational studies. And although the evidence report didn't have the bandwidth to go into that, and I don't think we've heard about any such existing um, uh, high quality observational studies, those could be done as something out of this work workshop. And I think we have heard some suggestions of how to use Medicare data, electronic health record data, and things on those lines that would be very promising. Thanks. Linda? Thank you. I want to appreciate and thank all of our distinguished speakers for their thoughtful and informative presentations and the discussions on this complex topic during the past three days. It's just been fantastic. And I agree with so many of the comments that I've been hearing in this session, but one thing as one of the funding agencies I'm hearing loud and clear is the need for continued new opportunities to drive evidence-based practice by improving standardization and implementation of best practices in nutrition interventions in the areas of nutrition screening related to cancer care, cancer development, and focusing especially in diverse or elderly at-risk populations. Once again, we are on the same page, Linda. Exactly what I was gonna say. When I think about um, the last couple of days, our speakers rightfully focused on the gaps. And I thought what you so aptly showed is how much work we have done. All day long, I get to hear from researchers and I get to see the applications coming into the NCI. And I see how much work you are doing. And I am just really heartened by the promise of what is ahead of us. And so I wanna say, keep going. I'm the last speaker, by the way, and I have about 10 seconds left. Keep going. This is an important field. Um, we won't stop here. I saw Michael Pollack, Pollack say, please don't let this gather dust. We will not let this gather dust. We will keep moving forward. And I will also say, we wanna go back to the cancer patient. I hope we realize that all cancer survivors are not the same, and I hope we take um, we take this message that all nutrition is not the same and all cancer patients are not the same, and we will tailor nutrition interventions to the time and specific um, stage and um, place that that cancer patient is and meet the cancer patient where they are with the appropriate intervention that is needed at that time and place. Um, and so get to work and we've got lots of work ahead and I will turn it back over to Keisha and Elaine. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna, for tackling that lightning round so swiftly. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, speakers, for sharing your thoughtful takeaways. I want to invite Elaine Trujillo and Dr. Hyatt to share any closing remarks that they might have. Thank you, Keisha. Um, I don't know what to say. My head is exploding. This has been fantastic. Um, there's so much great information. And I think back to it was probably four years ago when I reached out to Carrie Klebundi in the Office of Disease Prevention 
and just broach this idea of, you know, could this be a, a P2P workshop, this topic? And it really stems from the dietitians on the ground. The, they're the ones who I hear from, I work, you know, I work with, and they're the ones who have brought up this issue that, hey, patients are not getting the, the resources, they're not getting uh, the, the attention that they need. So I want to thank them, but I want to thank the ODP. I mean, you guys were fabulous. Keisha, thank you for keeping us on time. Um, the speakers, you were all fantastic. The NIH planning committee, um, the independent panel, I got to say, you guys have a big job and I do not envy the work that you have ahead of you, but we do look forward to that report and the next steps. Um, I just want to say, keep in touch. Um, you know, I had a former mentor and boss, John Milner, who used to say that the nutrition cancer community is like a family. We, we are, are not that big of a group. We see each other at meetings. Hopefully next time we will actually see each other in person. Um, but in the meantime, take some time to think about this workshop and send us your thoughts. We would really like to hear from you. So thank you. Dr. Hyatt. Oh, thanks. I, I think uh, thanks to everybody involved is uh, uh, need, needs to be reset multiple times, and I, and I add my appreciation to the NIH staff and to the speakers and to the uh, participants. We we you know persistently had over 350, maybe over much higher than that participants from around the country and around the world. It's been very impressive. Um, Many of you don't know, uh, but I, I spent uh, uh, five years of my life at the NCI uh, in the uh, DCCPS uh, Division of Cancer Control and Population Science, just as it was, it was beginning working with Barbara Reimer. And one of the things I learned then was the uh, promise and, and importance of transdisciplinary research. Uh, I think this topic, which has been um, revealed to me uh, during this these three days, uh, you know, lends itself to this kind of approach. We've got basic science, dietitians, oncologists, epidemiologists, uh, just to start. Um, but I, I think um, going forward, trying to tackle it with a uh, conceptual model that fills in the blanks, that takes standardization, that looks forward to um, applications and solutions using a transdisciplinary approach is going to be uh, very fruitful. Um, I'm very impressed with the need for understanding, as Dr. Hotch said, um, where to be, you know, begin at the end. Who are we trying to influence? Um, I, I would have to guess, and I'm almost done, <laughs> uh, I would have to guess that if we can, um, you know, follow the money, uh, who's paying for this, uh, where the money's going, that the whole problem of funding dietitians and making this a uh, cost center um, based on evidence will really uh, advance the field. I'd like to see work done to make that happen. Uh, thank you for the privilege of uh, leading the panel. Uh, as was just said, our work is not done yet. We've got, we've got, uh, we've got a report to put together. Uh, we've got a lot of things to work on, and uh, appreciate all the input that we've had over these last three days. Thank you. So I'll just have a few closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hyatt. I echo my thanks to Dr. Hyatt for taking on the task of workshop, workshop and panel chair and all the panelists, the workshop speakers, and you, our workshop attendees. You all made this virtual workshop successful, and we are much appreciative for all of your efforts. In addition, I have to th say thank you to everyone on the P2P planning team, uh, NIH, all the co-sponsors, and then I'm extremely grateful to those who have been working behind the scenes uh, to ensure that our workshop flows as smooth as possible. So the true MVPs go to Catherine Kozak and James Hubley. I have to call them out because they helped us navigate through a lot of the tech challenges that we had. Liz Vogt, Jen Hessian, Melanie Chancy, Alicia Wilson, Carrie Klebondi, and Bob Magnellis. So just to cover a few closing reminders, 
Responses to Chris Lynch's question can be sent to NIHP2P at mail.nih.gov. We put that also in the chat. We will compile the responses to be shared with the panel and planning committee. Um, also, you have an opportunity to comment. Uh, if you have an opportunity to comment, we encourage you to review and comment on the draft systematic evidence review prepared by the Minnesota uh, EPC. Uh, it's available on the ODP website uh, until August 23rd. You can also review and comment the on the panel's draft report once it's available in fall of 2022. Uh, and also, please, please complete the P2P workshop survey. Uh, it'll be a, a survey link has been posted in the chat. All registered attendees will receive an email as well. Uh, it should only take about five or 10 minutes to complete. We look forward to receiving your feedback. And I just wanted to alert everyone, all the attendants to that, there was a technical uh, glitch or difficulty with the day two survey emails last night and some attendees didn't receive the link. So we plan to resend that survey out to everyone soon. Thank you all for an excellent workshop. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.